Since 1974, Sun and Fun has been shaping the future of aviation. What began as a small group of dedicated aviation enthusiasts has grown into the annual Sun and Fun International Fly-In and Expo and so much more. Each year, pilots and spectators arrive in Lakeland to participate in the world-class event that is known as Florida's largest annual convention and the largest air show in the South. The impact of the week-long event lasts throughout the year. The Fly-In and Expo is the largest source of support for the Aerospace Center for Excellence, or ACE. ACE is building a foundation for the future of aviation through countless educational programs and activities offered year-round. The goal of each program is to educate, inspire, and motivate. Students in ACE programs receive a huge head start toward becoming the next generation of pilots and aviation personnel. I soloed my first aircraft when I was 16 and got my pilot's license when I was 17. Here at Sun of Fun, I have learned that aviation is all about community and um, that individuals help to inspire the next generation. I think it's very important for others to start young as well just because it, it opens a whole new world and allows you to see a different perspective. What I love about aviation is I love the freedom to be able to get in an airplane and fly and see new places and meet new people. Sun and Fun is much more than just a once a year flying event. It's also a great educational outreach opportunity. Sun and Fun has a lot of year-round programs that are great for education. Their destination aviation camps in the summer are great to inspire younger people to come into aviation. And then when they sort of follow those kids all the way up through middle school and high school and even into college. Ever since I can remember as a little kid, I used to look up in the sky and see airplanes uh, flying above and uh, just fell in love with them. Aviation is, is not just a, a career or, a, or a, a job, it's a lifestyle. Thanks to Sun and Fun and the Aerospace Center for Excellence and all the other programs offered here at Sun and Fun, I'll have my private pilot's license before I graduate high school. I think it's important for people to support the Aerospace Center for Excellence and Sun and Fun because it really helps provide students you know, a, a successful career and a successful future because that support system is there. My goals after I graduate, hopefully I can go to the Air Force Academy and spend four years there and then go into the Air Force as an officer and pilot some sort of fighter jet or drone. Once I graduate, I'd really like to pursue a career as a um, professional pilot. I'd like to fly corporately uh, and corporate aviation is where I see myself being in the future. The airlines are also a possibility if that presents itself for me. Because of the aerospace program, I um, actually have the opportunity to make my dreams come true. I love aviation, and I want to share that love with everybody else. Aviation is important to me because no one in my family has ever done this before, and so it's very special to me to do something that my family hasn't done yet. Aviation is extremely important to future generations simply because we need people in aviation. And our average pilot population is aging. We have less qualified mechanics, less qualified administrators than we've ever had before. I attended Sun and Fun several years ago, and that's what really helped build you know, my foundation for you know, me wanting to be in aviation. Without Sun and Fun and the Aerospace Center for Excellence, I wouldn't become you know, what I am in aviation today, and I wouldn't be as interested as I am now. Had I not attended Central Florida Aerospace Academy, I probably would not be in aviation at this age. I might have experienced it later in life, but you know, there's no telling what my career would have been. Without Sun and Fun, I wouldn't have had the opportunities to gain experience and network with more senior pilots to me and learn from their experiences. What's important to me about aviation, it's been a lifelong passion of mine. Um, ever since I was a little child and went to my first air show, I knew I wanted to fly. Uh, it's been a long road getting there, and seeing aviation progress as I progress and grow, um, it's important to me, and to pass that on to future generations as well. ACE, with the support of Sun and Fun, is able to ensure a brighter future through aviation. What an impressive thing it is to see the Aerospace Center for Excellence as we look around the area. and. I tell you, Larry Strain, as we look at that video, and you've walked around and seen some of that, it is, it is amazing the kind of education that these kids are getting. I, I love to go over there in the hangar and watch them put together airplanes. They're building airplanes over there, I mean, from scratch. And they're doing, you know, 
uh, rib stitching on fabric airplane wings. They're putting instruments in instrument panels. They're doing all sorts of things. And, uh, and this is the amazing part. You ask them a question, you better be ready to listen for about five minutes because <laughs> they know what they're talking about and they'll give you an answer that you probably, some part of it, don't understand. <laughs> That's but that is impressive. This is why we're here. This is why we're here, Steph. There's a lot of different ways you can get involved and support this particular agency. Obviously coming out, supporting the show. We thank you so much for that. But there's a raffle. Who doesn't want the opportunity to win some fantastic prizes? That's what we want to talk about right now. All of the money, of course, going to Sun and Fun to help support the mission. Here are the prizes. We've got a Bose A20 aviation headset. That's got Bluetooth and noise canceling technology. Four full week passes to the 2022 Southern Fun Aerospace Expo with preferred seating. Four full week passes to next year's Southern Fun with access to the 927 Club. We've got a ride with the Aeroshell team. Yay! <laughs> we all love that. Or the grand prize. Four full week passes to the 2022 Sun and Fun Aerospace Expo with a hotel, rental car, access to the 927 Club, and passes to the ACE flight deck. And all you have to do is go to flysnf.org to enter. Great. You know, what we haven't said, and people who are watching us all around the world may want to know, when do we start flying, Rob? We start flying in just about 18 minutes, and let's just talk briefly about who we're going to be seeing today, because we don't want anybody to tune out. It's, it's really a spectacular show. We'll start with the United States Army Special Operations Command Black Daggers Parachute Team, bringing in the American flag, and also the POW MIA flag, and that's when we'll have our national anthem. Yes, it is indeed. Uh, they'll be jumping out of a Globemaster III, big, big airplane from McCord Air Force Base, the 62nd Airlift Wing up there at McCord. And we'll have some champions coming up after that. And one of those guys is an American who is the nine-time U.S. Unlimited Aerobatic Champion, five-time and current rec uh, holder of the title of the World Freestyle Aerobatic Champion. He's from Nashua, New Hampshire. He's uh, Rob Holland. He's a spectacular performer. You will not believe what he does with that MXS RH airplane. He's got a high-powered monoplane that he flies with a lot of carbon fiber and about 385 horsepower, I think, something like that. But right after that, we're going to go to 185 horsepower Decathlon, an old trainer type airplane, only this one is brand new, flown by Greg Kuntz from Alabama. And for those who are here listening on the sound system, we will take a break because, Stephanie, you know, we're sharing sun and fun here and the lake. Lakeland Linder Nash, excuse me, International <laughs> Airport. I'll get that straight with Amazon, and they've got some work to do. They do, so we will be sure to get to that. I want to just give a quick uh, shout out. We've got folks checking in now from all over the planet. We mentioned earlier we had 82 countries uh, checking in with us yesterday. We've got Philippe who is watching from Germany. Hello, thank you so much for joining the broadcast. We've got uh, someone who goes by the Lion's Den watching from the Philippines. We've got Ooh. Fra checking in from Italy, fantastic. So by all means, hop on our social media pages, wherever you are watching this stream, be sure to let us know and we'll try to work in as many of those shout outs, even if you're just right here in our own backyard. So thank you to everyone who's watching. <laughs> then we go from that tiny little monoplane to a lot of noise and a lot of speed with the F-22 Raptor. That'll be followed by the United States Air Force Heritage Flight. Where they pair up some vintage aircraft from the history of the United States Air Force with this F-22 Raptor, the current the current, uh, one of the current fifth generation fighters. Coming up after that, we're gonna take you back in time, in history, to a thing, an event that took place today, 79 years ago. And we're talking about the raid on Tokyo with Doolittle Raiders taking the B-25s off the aircraft carrier, flying a surprise attack on Japan. That was the first time in over 2,000 years Japan had been attacked on its own soil. And that Doolittle Raid, as it is known, uh, has been dubbed the air mission against which all other air missions have been measured. We'll see one of those B-25s flown by Larry Kelly, known as Panchito. And Paul Dockery is here flying for his first time at Sun and Fun. And then I know Rob's favorites. Indeed, and I, and I will only say that because I've, 
I get to I get a chance to coach the narrators for the Blue Angels each and every year. And uh, back in 2007, I had one of the highest honors of my life. I was 2010, I should say. I was made an honorary Blue Angel, and that's uh, that's something that's important to me. As a matter of fact, I'll reach into my pocket and I always carry my my team coin with me. It says, "Once a Blue Angel, always a Blue Angel." So they will close out the show today, and how exciting it is to see them for the first time ever in their new jets the uh what do you call them the, the super Steph, blues the super blues <laughs> in the fa18 super hornet larry it's just going to be a great lineup and look at what just took off all right we want to get now to a very special organization that sort of ties in with things that make us feel good to be here and good to support the mission of this organization a lot of folks doing really powerful things around our military and honoring our veterans Let's talk right now about dream flights. I had an opportunity to connect with someone very special in the organization. We'd love to tell you more about it. One of the best parts of this job is getting to meet really incredible people doing really incredible things. And this is no exception. I would like to introduce you to Tim Dick. We are here to talk about Operation September Freedom and dream flights. Thanks for making the time. Thank you, Stephanie, appreciate it. Tell me a little bit about Operation September Freedom. What is this about? Operation September Freedom is the brainchild of uh, the Dream Flights organization. And what we're going to do from August 1st of this year to September 30th, we're going to take six steermen and we're going to fly them all around the country to every World War II veteran we can find and give them a flight and a steerman to give back to the, to the World War II folks who've given so much to us. How did, did Dream Flights then get its start? Why choose this? Uh, Dream Flight started with Daryl Fisher, who's the founder of the nonprofit. He uh, was involved in senior living facilities and he saw a need for seniors to do something. So it started in 2011. He gave a couple of World War II veterans a ride and he saw the magic, the magic that's created by just a simple flight. And it's simple to us, but to them, it, it really is a magical experience in, in most cases. Why the Stearman? The Stearman is. is particularly functional for this because one it's an open air cockpit you get the smell you get the noise and people who are participating in world war ii remember those things it triggers memories it, it brings them back to the time when they were there both the good and and the the all the experiences they had all the the sights the sounds the smells and and the whole pomp and circumstance of that flight brings back all of these memories how can someone nominate a vet for this? You can go to dreamflights.org slash honor and uh, there's a form to fill out to nominate someone for a flight. And all the flights are free. Uh, we're just trying to give back to those who gave. People out here might see this and feel inspired and want to make a donation to help further the mission. How can they do that? Uh, the same w website, dreamflights.org, uh, where you can make contributions. And we appreciate anything from as little as you can to as much as possible. Tim Dick, thank you so much for your time and for the amazing work that you do to help honor our veterans. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's a great day. I think so. Best part of the job, having the opportunity to meet people doing amazing things in all their various walks of life. Still much more to come. We will be back in just a couple of minutes.
Hey, what's up, everybody? So, air shows are back for the 2021 uh, air show season, and we're excited to be a part of it. My name is Captain Hayden Gator Fulham. I'm the commander and pilot of the A 10 demonstration team out here at Davis Monson Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona. I'm really excited uh, as my first year on the team to be a part of the air show family and show off this jet right here and these airmen uh, at air shows all over the country, and we're looking forward to it. We hope you guys enjoy your time at Sun and Fun. We're not going to be there this year, uh, but we hope uh, if you can find yourself at a show near us, come check us out. Look at our schedule on our Facebook page, our Instagram page, or our website, uh, and we hope to see you guys on the road. Attack. Very, very special time that we had when the Heritage flight took place yesterday, when the A-10 joined the uh, P-51 and the F-22 Raptor for that. What an incredible airplane that has been in business with the United States Air Force for four decades, and they think it's going to live even longer, Steph. I'm sure it will. If you just given the long history that it already has, that thing just keeps on ticking. Nice to see Gator in our airspace. This is something that's fascinating to me personally as someone who's uh, working to get my private pilot's license, actually in a Vans aircraft RV-12. Uh, if you've heard of Flying Magazine, and I know you have, and if you've heard of their about their column, I learned about flying from that. They are now getting into the podcast world. And uh, actually with this guy, he'll talk about that at the end. But it's a fascinating opportunity to talk to pilots who got themselves in a situation that they needed to work their way out of. I had a chance to catch up with someone from Flying Magazine to tell us more about it. Check this out. As a student pilot, I am always hungry for information. I have the good fortune to go for my PPL in a Vans Aircraft RV-12. So anything I can do to learn more about flying and safety, I'm all for it, which gives me a fantastic opportunity to introduce you to Lisa DeFries with Flying Magazine. How are you today? Doing fantastic. You can't be better. It's at a place like this, it's sun and fun with all the airplanes flying and the Blue Angels here. It's a pretty awesome week. Without a doubt. Tell me a little bit about efforts that you guys are doing to help improve pilot safety. Oh yeah, so you know, pilot safety is a critical part of our core content strategy with flying. Um, in the past uh, six months, we worked really hard to create a new podcast series um, called I Learned About Flying From That, I Laughed. It's a play off of our popular column, I Laughed, that has appeared in the magazine for almost 80 years. And we were able to bring that into a more interactive environment. These are reader-submitted stories about in-flight incidents that they had, that they were able to live to tell about. And it has become some of the most invaluable content in the magazine because other pilots are able to learn from the mistakes of others. Um, we get a lot of reader uh, mail talking about the fact that they read the article and then found themselves in the same incident not long after. And had they not read that information and learned from the individual who went through the same flight scenario, uh, that they might not have lived to tell about it. What made you decide to make the jump from a column into the world of audio podcasts? Yeah, so audio podcast is a super popular format. Um, there's over 150 million people in the United States subscribing to them. It gave us a great opportunity to bring our brand to life and that of our uh, partner, Avemco Insurance. Um, and because you can, you know, have a more interactive uh, interview with the pilot himself who submitted the story. In some cases, we even have live ATC recordings from the incident. It makes it a lot more interesting, and we can get a lot more information in depth from the pilot himself because we talk a little bit about the long-term consequences of what he went through in the experience. I definitely want to check this out. Tell me where I need to go to find this podcast. Easiest way to find it is on flyingmag.com. Uh, you can find the podcast on the drop down menu under I Laugh Podcast, or you can look on any one of the more popular podcast platforms to subscribe. Thank you so much. Lisa DeFries with Flying Magazine, helping pilots do better in the air. I'm all about it. I am so glad you got to chat with her, Stephanie. Lisa approached me a year ago. It'll be May, it'll, in May, and it took us until December to put it together. It's sponsored by Avemco Aviation Insurance Company, and we take that deep dive into those stories two a month, and it is just a tremendous opportunity to hear in the pilot's own words the dicey situations they got into and how they got out of them. And some are remarkably amazing in terms. One we released with a, was a guy from Cincinnati, Jim Fiorito, who when he was learning his, getting his instrument training, was taught zero, zero landings and takeoffs. He was flying up to Wisconsin. First airport went below minimums, went 
had to go missed approach had a problem with an airplane that he wasn't totally familiar with and so he didn't realize what was going on with the gear and picked up a lot of ice went to the second went to his first alternate it went zero zero while he was headed there and then he had to go back to a third alternate and when he was on the way they said i want you to remain calm <laughs> oh, He's, your airport port just went zero zero and he learned he had practiced it and it saved his bacon and i won't tell any more about that because there are even more wrinkles in that incredible story and they're all great even one where a guy took his his wife who was fighting cancer on her last flight oh, in boy. their plane to see a baseball game <sighs> okay with that we're going we'll to take a short break and we will be right back. I learned about flying from that. For the ride along, Captain. I've never been in one of these before. Even though Geico is but oh, 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 here we go. Here we go. Uh got cut off there. What were you saying? Oh no, no, no. Maybe the Geico's been proudly serving the military for over 75 years. Is that what you wanted to say? Mm-hmm. I have to say, you seem a lot chattier on TV. Mm. Geico, proudly serving the military for over 75 years. You okay back there, buddy? People ask me, you know, why, why, why Aeroshell? Why do, why do you fly behind Aeroshell? Because I've flown behind it my entire life. My father flew with Aeroshell. Wrap it up as peace of mind. Peace of mind. And we're very proud to be able to represent Aeroshell. They're our biggest sponsor. They've been great to the team. It's a proven product. I've flown so many hours behind it. It's one less thing I worry about. One of the most important things is safety because for years, We've used Aeroshell oil and continue to do so at this time. We use the Aeroshell W120, which has been a fantastic oil for us. And uh, it's just got great properties and, and the lubrication that it does for the engines. It, we never doubt what it's doing and how it's working for us. And we push the engines pretty hard. They build a fantastic product. Their engineering department, the formulations that they come up with that oil and the grease that we use on the aircraft are better than anything in the world. And we're back as we look at some of the airplanes on the ramp, a remarkable old T-28 Trojan from North American Aviation and Larry Strain. We're getting close to time to fly. We are indeed, but you know, before we do that, I want to introduce a friend of mine from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I've flown many of their airplanes with them. Doug Jeans was the president of a big museum in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Now he's come down here and he is the new executive director of Sun and Fun. And I'd like to watch this piece, please. To watch this thing come together for the first time, you know, starting in February and see how the machine that just rolls to get all this up to, to opening day is just amazing. So, so the whole program is built around STEM. So it's to, to you know, bring the sciences and everything into the kids, give them a laboratory, a place that they can implement ideas and all. And another part we're trying to do is, if we can raise the funds for it, is to build a sphere a science sphere it's called it's from NOAA and it, it comes fully equipped with 27 different lesson plans and it's just kind of a push and play and so we have classrooms in there and uh, you know, it does everything from weather to you know, hurricane tracking uh, you know they can do live hurricane tracking on it during hurricane season and it's just some amazing amazing equipment it's being funded through donations and through Sun and Fun Sun and Funds the funds raised from Sun and Fun go to uh, the ACE, basically, the you know, Aerospace Center for Excellence, that helps with all these programs, with the you know, open with the high school, the, the Skylab, building the Skylab and all. And we're taking donations during this week, especially uh, donations uh, during the week of Sun and Fun will be matched. We have a matching grant up to $100,000. Our STEM tent is set up right now to show some of these items, the 3D printer, the, the wind tunnel and all are in the STEM tent, which is right next to Hangar A in the grass area there. Um, you can donate there, you can donate, and, and if you're part of the 927 Club or the Ambassador Club, you can donate there, but online is, is probably the primary deal. And we have the bash, uh, um, 
that also helps raise funds for it. Everybody, I'm Rob Ryder with Sun and Fun 20, 2021, and with me, Stephanie Strickland, Larry Strain, Dave Kime, and we're about ready to get things going, Steph. I can't wait to see what's coming up. It's going to be a fantastic day for some flying. Well, Steph, if you look up to your right, you'll see that giant C-17 Globemaster III inbound from the 62nd Airlift Wing at McCord Air Force Base. Major Mac Delgado is at the controls today and on board is seven members of the Black Daggers Parachute Team, the United States Army Special Operations Command. They're now at 7,200 feet. They'll be punching out the back of the C-17, free falling, speeds of about 130 miles an hour before they deploy the ram air parachutes and begin their float to the ground. They'll be bringing in not only the MIA POW flag, but also our U.S. flag, and at that time, we'll have Abby Rogers from the Harrison School of Arts. She's an 18-year-old youngster. She has been uh, singing the national anthem at the 2019 Indoor Skydiving Championship, the annual Golf for Cure uh, event, Florida Southern Walk for the Right Women event, the American Legion Post and Veterans Day event, as well as the Lakeland Runners events, and many, many others. And we're happy to have her here to sing our national anthem. Now. As that aircraft approaches, with the wind the way it is, it's going to pass high overhead and go past us a little ways before they exit the airplane. That's because of the wind direction and the wind speed, and they want to make sure that they hit the parachute landing area, which is just out in front of the stage here to the left. You'll see some smoke popped out there. We call it popped as she throws it to the ground. And that is Staff Sergeant Ashley Stahl. She's a civil affairs manager from Fort Bragg. She is the ground controller at the parachute landing area. Now, since we are under stage and can't see high above us, we're gonna depend on other eyes to tell us when jumpers are away. And like I said, they will be falling about 130 miles an hour before they don't. Okay, jumpers, jumpers are away. Are away. Watch them free fall, and then you'll see the Ram Air parachutes as they open. Ram Air parachutes have a forward speed of about 17 miles an hour. The front end of the parachute is open, allowing air to flow into it. It inflates the parachute, making it much like an airplane wing. So it becomes very controllable then. They have what they call risers with handles on them, one on the right side, one on the left side. They grip those with their hands and they can pull down on the right one to turn right, pull on the left one to pull, turn left, and then if they want to slow up or spiral turn, they can pull down both of them very, very quickly. And that's what they do when they land. You'll see the bottom or the back of the parachute actually curl under and it will stall very much like an airplane wing, allow them to do a stand-up landing. So you can see the jumpers are out and under canopy, as we call. There are six of them up there, ladies and gentlemen. Sergeant First Class Jeff Mondo, Sergeant First Class Luke Rodolph, Sergeant First Class Ryan Tremblay, Sergeant First Class Shane Evans, Staff Sergeant Jeremy Keaton, Senior First Class Jim Brown, and Sergeant First Class Jerry Germany. And once again, Staff Sergeant Ashley Stahl handling the ground activities here at the parachute landing area. Now, as we look at these two jumpers, watch them as they get closer together. They are not going to collide. They're going to form up and do something called canopy relative work. And that is an ability that they have to come together. And that's going to be something they do as they hook up. They will then deploy the POW MIA flag. It'll be coming down first before the American flag comes down, Larry. Absolutely. And it is large, but let me tell you about the American flag. It is 5,000 square feet. That's huge. It is huge. And uh, attached to the bottom of uh, the parachute trooper's boot 
is a 50 pound weight to keep that flag furling as it uh, floats to the ground. They have about 30 seconds of free fall from that altitude before they have to open their chutes and begin their descent. They fly a uh, pattern very similar to uh, what Stephanie's gonna learn to do when she starts flying, and that's a pattern into the airport. They will fly a downwind, they will do a crosswind, and uh, that way that, what, 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 excuse me, that's what we call a pen wind penetration check. <laughs> and after, that's a lot though. Gotta get the teeth fixed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so after they turn base, then they turn final approach, just like an airplane would approach an airport. Steph, watch that and you'll learn a little something. Now, if we can see there, uh, we've got a view on uh, from our own eyes. You, there's a, you can see the two, uh, two paratroopers that have connected and they have now deployed that POW MIA flag. They are popping the red smoke and high above Gene McNeely has turned on his smoke. And we see the US flag on its way down. So ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to ask you to please rise and remove your cover. Add attention, please, for our national anthem. Oh, see, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watch We're so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red Bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave? Or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Wow, what a performance, ladies and gentlemen, by Abby Rogers. In addition to all of those things I told you about, she's done theater performances in the Newsies, Laurie in Oklahoma, Aquata in The Little Mermaid, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, The Fox and the Owl in Aesop's Table, Shelley in Hairspray, and she sings it very well. Thank you, dear. Fine job. Now, as the American flag, look at that, 5,000 square feet as it touches the ground. It is allowed, ladies and gentlemen, it does not have to be burned if it touches the ground as long as there is a valiant effort to try to save it. And that's why you see those people out there trying to keep the American flag off the ground. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, our opening maneuver here by the Black Daggers. Globemaster will be setting up for a landing. And as soon as he touches down, you're going to see Mr. Gene McNeely in that T-6. He was circling the jumper, providing the smoke. Gene is going to show us just about two or three maneuvers of his T-6 Texan. If you flew it uh, for the United States Navy in World War II, it was called an SNJ. But it is the airplane that trained more American pilots for World War II than any other aircraft. You know, as we look at the Black Daggers, you know, getting getting down out of their parachute rigs, they're careful to make sure that the shroud lines go over their heads properly <laughs> so they don't tangle them. But then they take about 10 minutes to repack them, and they do it every time very, very carefully so that they can get not only a, a proper opening, but a smooth opening as well. Because when those ram air uh, 
canopies inflate, they can give uh, quite a jerk on the on the pilot. So they have uh, they have some things that help them with that. But there is the SNJ T6, the Texan, the Harvard. Call it what you will. It was the pilot maker. Absolutely, round motor. Like a I round said. motor. <laughs> yeah. Steph, yes, ma'am. So you mentioned this earlier, that at the controls today is Mac, but for the previous two days, oh, well, yes. and before, there has been a phenomenal pilot, call sign Voodoo, Major Courtney Voodoo Vit. And I had an opportunity to get into that C-17 and sit down in the cockpit and talk to her about how she flies this beast of an airplane. Check this out. Always a good day when I have a chance to get up on the flight deck of the C-17. This is the West Coast demo team out here. Joined now by Major Courtney Voodoo Vit. Hey, how are you doing, Voodoo? Good stuff. Thanks for having me today. I have to ask you about how nimble this airplane is. You're out here flying it. This is your seat. Seeing the crowd below, tell me about what this bird can do. This is an amazing aircraft. So the C-17 is a multi-role type aircraft. It is a multi-role in the sense of it is a heavy strategic operating aircraft. They like to call us strategic and tactical because we can go across the world, deliver goods, as well as to austere airfields, land on the dirt, short airfield operations, and go around the world. So this is amazing aircraft, and I'm so happy to be here. When you're actually flying the demo and you're so light, and you're so, you know, sort of cleanly configured, if you will. What's the difference between flying at an air show versus flying operationally when you're loaded up? Absolutely, so operationally, we usually have a lot more weight in the back in the cargo compartment. The demo, we fly clean. So there's nothing in the back besides our load masters. We also fly it at a lighter weight profile considerably when you look at our mission set. The mission set, we have a lot more fuel on board. We have a lot more cargo on board. What that does is it allows us to move the aircraft a little bit quicker because of stall margins, just with how fast the jet's going and then how much it weighs, or the opposite, how fast the jet's going and how little it weighs at that time. So we're able to maneuver a little bit cleaner, have a little bit more buffer room for it. Our typical air show is around, we fly between 240 knots and we can go up to 310 for our high speed pass. Our slow, slow speed is around 165 usually is what we fly it. And then our clean configure, or when we fully configure, we're going up to our approach speed, which is oft, oftentimes around 140. We have a lot of general aviation fans who like to watch this, so they understand angle of attack. You know, they understand how you bank. Talk to me a little bit about how nimble this thing is when you need it to be in flight using those sort of, you know, pilot friendly terms. Absolutely. So it is a fly by wire aircraft. That means everything is really controlled right here by the stick and any short movements automatically move the flight control system, which can operate anything from the rudders at the back. We have slats and flaps here, but the amazing thing about this jet is really it's roll rate. We have people come in oftentimes that fly fighters and they watch us maneuver and they're like, my goodness, look at the roll rate of it. We can also pull up to 2.5 Gs in most configurations. So when we're operating the aircraft itself, it allows us to move quickly in and out of combat areas, in and out of airfields very quickly and just maneuver the plane at very high speeds low to the ground. We can go lowest 300 feet just on a normal low level with our tech orders and move around for that. So it is extremely fast because of that fly-by-wire for its roll rate. Voodoo, we thank you for your service. I do have to ask you though, what's the best part about flying an air show? The best part about flying the air show truthfully is the people. I can tell you 100% that is what I loved as a little kid and cool story here. I met a F-16 pilot when I was seven years old. He knew my dad and we started talking he came out to the air show yesterday, 25 years later, and I got to invite him out and he got to see me fly. So it's the people and the relationships that you make that make the air shows worthwhile. So thank you to all of our fans out there and for coming to watch us too. Voodoo and the C-17 West Coast demo team, this has been an absolute treat. So with that, thank you so much for being a part of this and being a part of the Sun and Fun Air Show. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Steph, it's great you could get in there in the cockpit with Voodoo and talk to a lady who's flying that very important airplane. And we also got to see Gene McNeely in our picture-in-picture uh, -picture there as he lines up to land here on runway 27 left. Look at the landing gear on that airplane. That is a very narrow gear, and it made the airplane exceptionally challenging to handle on the ground. 
Later fighters like the P-47 Thunderbolt and the P-51 Mustang, one of which is going to be landing here shortly, had a much wider stance of its main landing gear, made it actually a little easier to handle on the ground. The dreaded ground loop is something they didn't want to mess with. Hey, before we move on any farther, as he's getting in, down, uh, landing the airplane, I want to share a little bit about a couple of companies that have made it possible for me to be here. One is Sporty's Pilot Shops, and I want to show you this. There are a lot of aircraft handhelds out there, but this one is very unique. It's won some awards. Sporty's Pilot Shop has come out with a PJ2, the new aviation handheld radio with full-size jacks in the top where you can plug in a standard aviation headset. No adapter required. Just plug it in, turn it in, punch in a frequency, and you are good to go. Comms, pure and simple. Want to know more about this award-winning radio from Flying Magazine and Aviation Consumer? Take a look. Aviation.com, I should say sporties.com slash PJ2. Sporties.com slash PJ2. And there's the Mustang going out right there. And uh, we're going to go up to Dave Keim right now. David, it's all yours, my friend. Thank you, Rob. I'm up here with Master Sergeant Mike Dunkelberger. Uh, what do you think his call sign would be? Let's go with Dunk. That's it. And he's going to tell you. He's on the crew of that uh, beautiful C-17 Globemaster III we've been watching. And he's going to tell you all about it. Dunk, take it away. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure this afternoon to describe for you today's flight demonstration by America's newest airlifter, the Boeing C-17 Globemaster III. In just a few seconds, the crew will be performing a max effort takeoff. This maneuver will have the giant aircraft at an altitude of over 1,000 feet, well before the departure end of the runway. Let's watch as the C-17 takes to the skies here for the Sun and Fun Aerospace Expo. The crew for today's demonstration is Major Nick Coblio, Major Mac Delgado, Major Courtney Vitt, Major Hatton Updike, Technical Sergeant Raul Gutierrez, and Technical Sergeant Ryan Anderson. They are based out of Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington State. This highly experienced crew has a combined total of over 19,000 flight hours, with 4,037 flown in combat. They have 23 deployments in support of counterinsurgency and humanitarian operations in the Middle East and around the world. In addition to their combat deployments, the crew has combined total of 43 missions to Antarctica, with six airdrops on the South Pole in support of the National Science Foundation's Antarctic mission. While the crew is maneuvering for their first pass at show center, I'd like to share some facts with you about this aircraft. The C-17 made its first flight in September of 1991. Since then, the aircraft has set over 30 world records, including payload to altitude, time to climb, and longest airdrop in mission in history. The new age design includes a modern computerized glass cockpit, heads up displays at both pilot stations, and an advanced cargo handling system allowing it to operate with a crew half the size of similar cargo aircraft. The crew will now perform a high-speed pass. With the aircraft capable of accelerating to over 350 miles per hour, this pass demonstrates the extremely powerful engines of this magnificent jet. Ladies and gentlemen, the C-17 is now approaching from your left to right. Please notice how quiet it is while passing by show center. This gives the crews a tactical advantage while flying low over hostile territory and allows for tactical operations at airfields near heavily populated cities. This reliable airlifter combines the intercontinental cargo carrying capabilities of large aircraft such as C-5 Galaxy, 
with the short field landing potential of the much smaller C-130 Hercules. The C-17 is powered by four Pratt & Whitney F-117 engines. These are the same engines used on the Boeing 757. Each engine delivers over 40,000 pounds of thrust. This amount of thrust allows the Globemaster III to carry over 170,000 pounds of cargo for an astounding range of up to 2,400 nautical miles without having to utilize air-to-air -air refueling. Now approaching from your right to left, the aircraft will perform a slow speed pass. During the pass, please notice the wing leading edge slats and the large powered lift wing flaps. These devices literally change the shape of the wing and are the key to its low final approach speed, enabling this aircraft to land and stop in very short distances. Ladies and gentlemen, please get your cameras ready as this will be your best opportunity to take photos of this amazing state-of-the-art machine. The C-17 will now maneuver for a circle over the airfield, showing its ability to fly at slow speeds and demonstrate its advanced aerodynamics in action. The aircraft uses a quadruple redundant fly-by-wire system for the operation of flight controls. This is combined with four separate flight control computers, each capable of controlling the entire system independently. The system is designed to optimize the capabilities of the C-17, yet maintain enough redundancy to protect against a wide variety of failure conditions. Another feature of this amazing flight control system is that the aircraft can also be flown in an entirely mechanical backup mode further safeguarding against abnormal situations. As the aircraft approaches from your left to right, please notice the upturned wingtips or winglets. These decrease aerodynamic drag and increase fuel economy. Now to give you a better idea of the aircraft's overall size, those winglets are nearly nine feet tall. Ladies and gentlemen, in case you were wondering how big the C-17 is, its wingspan is roughly 170 feet. The T-tail is over five stories tall, and fully loaded, it weighs over 580,000 pounds. As you can see, the C-17 is extremely maneuverable at both high and low speeds, making it easy to operate in any tactical situation. The C-17 will now overfly the field to prepare for landing.
Now here are some more interesting facts about the Globemaster III. This aircraft can fly anywhere in the world nonstop using its air-to-air -air refueling capability. Air Force personnel routinely fly 24-hour missions with a single air crew. The most basic crew complement required to operate a C-17 is merely two pilots and one loadmaster. The heavy-duty landing gear allows it to land on surfaces such as cement, sand, dirt, and even ice. As a result of this, C-17s have been in over 180 countries and literally every continent in the world since production began. Lastly, all current Air Force crews are trained on the use of night vision goggles or NVGs allowing them to operate while in unlit, austere locations around the world. As the crew makes their final approach, the aircraft will be flying at just under 120 miles per hour. They are simulating arrival to a shortened airfield where hostile forces are present. This versatile tactic allows the C-17 to operate at over 6,000 more airfields worldwide than commercial wide-body aircraft. Now the crew will demonstrate the very short landing distance of this steadfast airlifter using just over 1,000 feet of runway to bring this aircraft to a stop. The C-17 is currently demonstrating the ability to back under its own power, which gives it increased maneuverability while offloading cargo and the capability to operate at smaller unsupported airfields. All the maneuvers you have seen here today are examples of those flown by our operational air crews on a regular basis as they provide the highly responsive and flexible airlift capability for America. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's flight demonstration. As with any aircraft, we couldn't fly today's performance without the great support of our maintenance team. The crew with us this week are Staff Sergeant Sean West, Senior Airman Cody Stoffer, and Airman First Class Brandon Medlock. We hope that you enjoyed today's performance. Please like us and follow our team on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to tag us in any pictures or posts at hashtag C17 West Coast Demo Team. On behalf of the men and women of the United States Air Force, Air Mobility Command, Joint Base Lewis McCord, the 62nd Airlift Wing, and the West Coast Demo Team. We thank you for being with us today and hope you've enjoyed the brief look of the C-17 Globemaster III, the United States Air Force's core airlifter and workhorse, which will continue to provide rapid global mobility for America today, tomorrow, and well into the 21st century. Thank you, Master Sergeant Mike Dunkelberger. How about a great big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? for the C-17 and the Master Sergeant telling you about it. And what a great aircraft. Rob, how about? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dave Kime. And we'll be back with our next act, Rob Holland, world freestyle aerobatic champion right after this break.
done yet. That's the wind sock. Indicates what direction the wind is coming from. But for this next performer, Larry Strain, we don't care, <laughs> and neither does he. It doesn't make any difference, Rob. And I got to tell you something. This man you're going to watch, I hope you got your cameras ready because he literally makes up maneuvers that no one has ever seen before. And the brakes have been released. The guy on the screen right there from Nashua, New Hampshire, he is the nine-time U.S. Unlimited National Champion. He is the five-time and current record holder of the World Freestyle Aerobatic Championship. It's Rob Holland. Let's take a look at the champion going to work right now. This is a very, very agile airplane, very unstable, but watch him now as he goes upside down, pushes to the outside. He is experiencing there some six negative Gs, all the blood rush into his head. He's gonna go into a, a hammerhead. He's gotta apply opposite aileron. He's not gonna just do one, but he's gonna do a double hammerhead. One of the most challenging maneuvers to do. Let me tell you more about this MXH, uh, MXSRH. It is built for Rob Holland. It has a 385 horsepower motor on it. And as he climbs, he's gonna continue to roll the airplane around. That is a very slow rolling maneuver right there. But we're gonna see a roll rate that will exceed 500 degrees per second. And that's a lot of green, blue, green, blue for Rob Holland. As he now goes high overhead, he's pushing again, negative Gs, uncomfortable as can be. He does the forward flip. He'll hang it there on the prop and let the nose now fall through the horizon recovering upside down at about 40 miles an hour, and the thrust and power of this very light 1,500-pound airplane and the 385 motor uh, horsepower motor on the front enables him to go from almost standing still to flying speed very, very rapidly. Now watch this. Right there, we call that the Nivik. And this, is the Zwerval turn. It's turning around like a pinwheel. Did you see that? The folks here at Lakeland in the audience are kind of astounded here as Rob Holland now pushes the airplane again, negative Gs. Positive Gs are hard to take. Negative Gs just hurt even worse. From zero airspeed, he'll turn it around and watch him go into a knife edge descent. Quarter rolls to inverted, point rolls to upright, that's a 500 plus degree turn. Accelerating to over 250 miles per hour. Rob Holland has some great sponsors that I want to tell you about. Among them, Bremont Watches, Champion Aerospace, Afterglow Aircraft Solutions, MGL Avionics, Lycon Engines, Whirlwind Propellers, Tubro Aviation, and that great company, Afterglow Aircraft Solutions, helped him change his paint job. Not so much that it looks different, but he used to do vinyl on the plane, and it would peel away. And he is thrilled with this wonderful paint job that he's got on his MXSRH. I hope you'll check out Afterglow Solutions on the web. That's the Cardiac Express. The airplane uses a lot of gyroscopic tumbling capabilities. Very lightweight, very high power engines, and these airplanes are doing maneuvers that some 40 years ago weren't even thought possible because of the very lightweight and high power to weight ratios that we have. Over the top, another forward flip. Now, as Rob approaches, there's a quick snap roll. Aileron roll to the right. Leveling off just about 15 feet above the ground, he experiences 10 or 11 Gs positive going up. You and I would be losing our lunch as he does the spiraling tower. Now he'll stop the roll, put it into a flat spin for a turn, point the nose down. This is the guy that now five times has won this World Freestyle Aerobatic Championship in Olympic level competition as he does the slide winder. A quick outside shoulder roll into the slide winder. Now get your cameras ready. A torque roll, hanging it on the whirlwind propeller, backing it up. 
He'll roll out. Now watch him as he continues to roll. He'll get the airplane upright. Get the energy to come straight up. He sets that vertical line. You can actually see the smoke change as he sets the vertical lines. Cameras going, get the movie cameras going. Using every bit of this 3,000 foot box. Another incredible tumble now. He'll go from about 100 miles an hour forward, and he's going to stop it right about now. That's the Cobra maneuver with nearly 110 degrees of change in attitude. Ladies and gentlemen of Lakeland and those of you watching on the web, how about a big round of applause for Rob Holland? And now it's time to go live to the cockpit and say hello to Rob. Hey, Rob, it looks like you got good weather out there now and a nice job on the first half of the show. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. It's a beautiful day here at Sutter Sun. The sky is up. We got an amazing crowd down there. Look at all those people. How's everything going down there for you, sir? Rob, it looks great, my friend. Well, you're going to get things started for Act Two. Yes, sir. Just climbing up, tightening my belt, getting ready to start the second half. We still got some amazing show coming up. We got the F-22 Raptor coming. We got the Blue Angels coming. It's going to be a great air show. Folks, I'll be back inbound in about 20 seconds. Thank you, Rob Holland. 300 miles per hour is the speed he will be reaching on this dive. The airplane is so strong with its lightweight carbon fiber materials it can withstand plus or minus 16 Gs. He's on the way down. Now watch this roll rate. Point rolls on the down line. The precision with which Rob Holland flies, that's that 500 degree roll rate and accelerating to that 300 miles per hour. He started flying in 1992, over 14,000 hours of total flight time to his credit in 180 different types of airplanes. Earlier this, in his earlier years, he flight instructed, towed banners, flew for a commuter airline. He's always had his sights on air shows, though. He started his air show career back in 2002, distinguished himself by blazing a trail of innovation, developing aerobatic maneuvers never seen before. He's now known as one of the most decorated aerobatic pilots in U.S. history, having won multiple titles as that I've, that I've told you about. Up the 45. Throws that left wing into the, into the slipstream and does a four-time knife edge tumble. You can check his Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash ultimate air shows. Find him on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Share your air show pictures uh, on your Facebook page. He's a graduate of Daniel Webster College back in 1997 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Aviation Management and a Bachelor of Science degree in Flight Operations. An airline transport pilot, a C certified flight instructor, certified instrument instructor, all of those, and a diverse aviation career. And the 2019 winner of the Eric Muller Trophy 
five-time world freestyle champion, nine-time U.S. national aerobatic champion, ten-time U.S. national freestyle aerobatic champion, an honorary Blue Angel. He was he was surprised down at Pensacola back in 2019 when they made him an honorary Blue Angel. That's a very very special thing. He's also an honorary uh, Snowbird inductee and a three-time recipient of the Charlie Hillard Trophy. He is a winner. And again, I want to mention that great sponsor he's got. Afterglow Aircraft Solutions. He's very, very happy with the paint job that they did. They can do touch-ups, they can do full paint jobs for you, and you can see some of the videos of the uh, progress of that paint job on social media. They also do aircraft interiors and much, much more. After, Afterglow Aircraft Solutions. Now watch him, he's slowing down. He's gonna pull the power, the nose up, the power up. He is now hanging it on that whirlwind propeller, turning it into a helicopter. What do you think, Lakeland? How do you like Rob Holland right now? The 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 seconds holding it there, turning that airplane into a helicopter. Oh, now he's heated things up quite a bit. He's gonna relax a little bit. Although that turn right there was probably 10 Gs. And shortly, he's going to be bringing it into land. But this is going to be another special video photo opportunity for you as he pops the smoke. He'll come by and do a knife edge pass. You'll see the top and the bottom of that airplane from Afterglow Aircraft Solutions and that new paint job he's got. Top up, bottom up. <laughs> He'll go down to the other end of the aerobatic box. It's our space in the sky that is reserved for the airplanes. This is a way to lose altitude very, very quickly. This is called a flat spin. And Stephanie, this is not something we're gonna have you do right away. But eventually you will. We'll teach you spins. We'll do all that kind of stuff. Okay, camera's on. Hold them sideways. Watch as Rob Holland now comes down and sets up to land. He'll come back on the power, but he says he'll touch the I'm not done yet. So he rolls it one more time. And that puts a wrap on a spectacular performance by Rob Holland. How do you like it, Lakeland? And those of you watching around the globe, we are thrilled about all of that. Larry Strain, I love what I just saw. <laughs> you know, it's incredible. And I asked, I asked Rob once, I said, and I, and I mean it, he, he has done things with an airplane no other performers have seen. Yes. And he said, I asked him, I said, how long does it take you to do one of those? He says, well, I'll, I will think about something, think about something, then I'll go up to altitude, of course, because I don't want to be close to the ground, and I'll try something. And he said, well, that didn't work, so maybe I, I need to stick a lot more rudder in that. So I'll stick a lot more rudder. And eventually, it'll come about of what he wants to do. But he has worked a year and a half on a single maneuver before, before, it's got it, before he's got it perfected. But that is professionalism. Indeed it is. And, and it may take him a year to perfect it, and he probably f has to fly it over a thousand times to make sure he can do it every time. Because these pilots, like Rob Holland and Michael Gooley and, and all the others that are, that are so spectacular at their craft, they never go into a maneuver without knowing what the outcome will be. It looks like they're in for the ride, but not always. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. Hey, look at who's coming through right now. Yeah, well, from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Mr. Greg Koontz in his little 180 horsepower biplane. Now look at that. Negative G's trying to throw him out of the cockpit. and. He's strapped in there with a five-point harness to keep him from... Oh, wait a minute. I think he's calling me. Hey, Greg, can you hear me? Well, listen, I, I thought we could talk a little bit if you if you got a time. I don't want to distract you from your flying. Oh, no. Shoot, man. I just uh, I do it my eyes closed anyway. 
Well, listen, why don't, we, why don't you tell us exactly, talk us through the first couple of maneuvers of what you're doing with the airplane. Okay, well, I like to start out with a lot of little basic maneuvers with some of their own twists. Uh, you know, the decathlon, the decathlon is uh, the most popular aerobatic trainer, like a whole lot of the people you see today, uh, and like Rob Holland. Rob Holland, trained, he probably trained the decathlon. I know he has trained a lot of people in the decathlon. It's just a great airplane for that. So we're going to go through a few maneuvers like that and uh, for the first session. So let's see. If I've got the altitude right, I'm going to come on in for a snap up top of the loop after I just get a little bit of a little head of steam going here. And around we go. Yeah! <laughs> Boom! Stop it right there. Out the other side. Good little wind coming off the crowd blowing me out a little bit. So you'll see me kind of get a little crooked every now and then. And give that a correction. Okay, let's go for a hammerhead. And this hammerhead, though, let's do a quarter roll. Put the pretty view of the airplane to everybody. And kick it over and come back the other way. Yeah. All right, let's do a square loop. And here we go. Little vertical. Not as good as Rob can do in that MX, that's for sure. But we can do one. All right, inverted. High flat, make square top. And straight down, look at the runway, and oh, that's <laughs> orgy, out the other side. Greg operates a, uh, a school up in Alabama. As, as a matter of fact, it's a bed and breakfast called the Sky Country Lodge. If you would like to go, if you're already a pilot and would like to do some upset training, or go up and do a two-day aerobatic course with him. You got four lessons there. Uh, he feeds you and beds you down and everything, and then flies in that decathlon. Get a hold of Greg after the show because he loves to do it. But hey, we're enjoying watching and listening to you do your maneuvers, Greg. Hey, here goes a little roll on top of the loop, taking advantage of the nice ailerons on the decathlon. And started out with a little slow, didn't I? Okay. And after that, let me pull up and gain a little altitude on this with a little reverse turn. Greg, you told me that uh, the problem that a lot of people have in learning uh, aerobatics is, is making the three-dimensional aspect of it. What, what does that mean? Well, it's getting out of some habits you get in uh, airplanes when you know you're going to be right side up all the time. And not really thinking about how the aerodynamics works as you roll over upside down. And so it, that's, that's the biggest part of it. A lot of it's where to look to understand what's going on with the airplane also and to keep track of your location and attitude. So, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Roll out on that. Yeah. Getting back lined up where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And let's come back for a couple point rolls. You play, are you playing with that throttle at all or you fly with a constant power setting through all your maneuvers? I fly with all I can get. <laughs> I understand. That means it's all Don't the way forward. Don't worry about it. Full throttle. All right, it's a point roller, too. Greg taught a lot of pilots aerobatics. That was a rarely seen three-point roll. <laughs> All right, let's get us a little altitude here so we can have some more fun. That airplane is uh, tubular steel and fabric. It's not carbon fiber or anything like uh, you just saw Rob Holland fly. Yeah, it's a very strong construction, very traditional construction. The new carbon fibers really have a lot of advantage and uh, also cost. <laughs> uh, they're trying to keep the cost out of a plane like this. You just stay with the old way that really works really good. I mean, that's, it makes a strong, very strong airplane, uh, tubular steel. It's a big, strong truss. All right, coming in for a, a uh, humpty bump with a surprise. How much wind are you fighting up there, Greg? Looks like quite a bit. Yeah, it's moving me all the time. I'm making a lot of little corrections to the uh, 
to keep from getting too far away from the crowd. There we go, vertical. Half on the way up, running out of speed, flop this thing over. There we go. No doubt about it that Greg has a lot of fun flying his airplane. <laughs> Hammerhead turn around, lets the airplane run totally out of airspeed, kicks, and it's just a good old basic loop. kicks harder yeah, and left the rudder. You see the correction right now as I'm moving back in. Some maneuvers, you really can't make much of a correction during them, so you get, to, you get a whole lot of drift. Now the loop, we can just put a little twist on the way up, like I just did. And then, got to redo it on the back side, see that little twist? And that corrects for the wind, that stayed right here over the line pretty easily. And there's a hammerhead the wrong way, to the right. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see if I can make this thing tumble like that fancy Rob Holland. All right, hey, I'm just going to give it a try. All right, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> well, executed very well, my friend. Yeah, I think I mostly got an uh, outside <laughs> shoulder roll on that one. <laughs> but, but it was cool. I liked it. Yeah. Okay, coming back at you with a bunch of rolls. We're going to do uh, one maneuver, just nice and slow, barrel roll, big old barrel roll. So, I think it lined up here good. And up we go. It's harder than it looks. A lot of things are changing constantly, and you have to keep up with them, changing the flight control to make a nice, smooth, consistent circle around with the airplane. A lot of pilots have a difficulty with that one. All right, I'm going to come back to, to finalize everything here and uh, do my salute to veterans. I do this, I've been doing this for about 10 years now, I think. And uh, the whole idea here is, of course, we all know that all over the world, we have Americans out there, men and women in uniform, there keeping us free, keeping the United States interest free. And uh, we just got to give them some recognition. Because they are there, we are here today, outside on a Sunday afternoon, enjoying ourselves with no worries. That's, that's what they do. They worry so we don't have to. So here comes my salute to veterans. Ladies and gentlemen, from Alabama, that's Mr. Greg Kuntz doing a wonderful job there flying the Super Decathlon. Only 180 horsepower, but he can certainly make that thing talk. Yeah, thanks, Larry. We're going to land this thing. All righty. Well, we just heard him uh, talk to George Klein, our air boss, and his son, Brad Klein, and he's going to land on runway 27. By the way, uh, as they do that, uh, I want to tell you something about the propeller on that airplane, because it used to have a different kind of propeller on it. He has now a Hartzell propeller. 
just like Michael Gulian has on his airplane, just like every Cirrus aircraft that's ever been built, about 8,000 of those have. Hartzell Propellers started business back in 1917 in Piqua, Ohio, when Orville Wright approached the Hartzell Lumber Company of Piqua to build propellers for their early airplanes. And now they are building propellers for the most advanced propeller-driven aircraft in the world. Hartzell Propeller built on honor. 4,000 propellers built just last year. So, uh, and I've got a Hartzell Propeller on my airplane too, and I'm thankful for the family-owned company that still thinks that built on honor is right for you, and that's what you'll get with a Hartzell Propeller. Okay, Stephanie, Larry, we're not done yet. No, yeah. but we've got to take a little break, don't we? Well, I think we're actually first going to talk a little bit about something that's a pretty popular attraction around these parts. Perhaps you've seen it. We are talking <laughs> about the jet mobile. Oh. Now, hang on. But <laughs> yeah. This was a story. We had so much content yesterday <laughs> that we wanted to have an opportunity for you to see some modifications. But before we get to that, we need to set the stage for those of you watching us from other countries who haven't had a chance to see what the jet mobile is all about. Check out this story from Mark Allen. <laughs> A Boeing 747 engine, the very epitome of technology, 64,000 pounds of thrust, a modern marvel of power, encasing the very latest in seats? Its creator calls it a jet mobile. I'm a 747 captain, and uh, I look out to that number one engine on the left hand side, and I thought many times that, gee, that, that engine would look really good on wheels. When he told me that he wanted to build this jet mobile uh, 747, out of a 747 engine, I thought, if I let him do that, I will go to heaven. A year in the making, the jet mobile's beauty is way more than skin deep. I used a lot of barnacles in developing this. They now have uh, two first class seats uh, and a full interior from a 747. It's uh, got a uh, driver's seat that is the captain's seat and it's got a spiral staircase inside it's 22 feet long it weighs about 3,000 pounds it goes 12 knots its stall speed is 12 knots its top speed is 12 knots it's but it'll never get off the ground is the jet mobile going to pry air show eyes from the sky maybe not but it certainly does turn heads Number one, it's a work of art. He did a fantastic job, but I really think it's either too much time or too much money on his hands, one or the other. I spent pretty much every day off doing this. On his days off, he would come home and disappear into the hangar for 12 or 14 hours at a time. The cost of it is a little bit top secret, but uh, it's probably north of 50000 I don't, my wife's right there, so... A lot of people that have slightly uh, sarcastic uh, comments, uh, I always come, my comeback is always, you want one of these, don't you? And they all go, oh yeah. Paul's mission with his Jetmobile is to support charitable causes. So given its obvious appeal, is Paul considering mass production? My wife would kill me. So enjoy this one-off, sound effects included. The clear prop is the best. Now we want to show you a couple of new things that he decided to put on the Jetmobile. Check this out. <laughs> I've had a chance to see this before, but I've never had the opportunity to actually meet the people who created it. And I understand you approved the modifications you made. Tell me what you've modified. Well, in the last uh, seven years, I've put a bunch of stuff on, but the most important thing that I've gotten on is my new bubble machine, and I've also got an afterburner. You must love him so much. I do love him so much. <laughs> so much fun to be his wife. <laughs> it's actually, it brings so many people joy. What's the reaction? Oh, it's been great. It's unbelievable. I got a chance to show off the afterburner uh, a couple nights ago, and the crowd went wild. Yes, it's really fun, and it's... It's a more exciting part of it. it. You know, the bubbles are great for the kids, but uh, this is real adult stuff that we got going on now. And there's night shows that uh, occur around uh, the air show circuit, and we'll have it for them then, and that's the best display. 
I can't wait to see that. When he first came to you with the idea, did it take a lot of convincing or did you just know? Did you know you're like, okay, we're, we're gonna do this. Oh. <laughs> I love it so much that I can't even say that I, I would be silly to say that I didn't want it in the first place. So much fun. We go through the crowds, they go crazy and it's just, they bring excitement to us. We give it back to them and it goes back and forth from the youngest people to the oldest people here, men, women, everybody loves it. It's so much fun. And uh, I was going to say, I sponsor myself, so I don't take any money. It's only for charity and donation purposes. And we do good things around our, we live in Spruce Creek. And so I've done weddings and I've done birthdays and stuff for friends. And it's just a, a good deal for the community also in Spruce Creek. I can't wait for you guys to have the opportunity to check this thing out. Outstanding job to the both of you. This is so fun, such a crowd pleaser. Well, with the afterburner, a whopping 14 miles an hour, he went <laughs> scorching down the runway uh, yesterday. And his and wife out there with a checkered flag. <laughs> Is that thing street <laughs> legal? Oh, that must be. Let's take it for a spin on the highway, see what happens. <laughs> It is for one quarter of a mile. <laughs> yeah, until you get caught. We have a raffle coming up here. Sure we do. Need, we need money for Sun and Fun. Took a bath without having a show last year, and they, they need money, and they've got a, a raffle coming up. Steph, tell us about all of the great prizes. Absolutely. I'll get it started, and then, Rob, I'll have you pick up some. So check this out, you guys. Okay. You can get a Bose A20 headset that's got Bluetooth and noise-canceling technology. The next one, we have four weekly passes to Sun and Fun 2022 with preferred seating. After that, four weekly passes with Ace Ambassador flight deck access. We're just we're inching up the uh, inching up the the, uh, the 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 ladder on this. Next one, here's one that I have never been able to do. Uh, the, the four weekly passes to Sun and Fun 22 with access to the 927 Club, and then. A ride with the Aeroshell aerobatic team. Those guys are so nice. The Southern gentlemen, you actually get to go upside down with them. And the grand prize, drum roll. Four weekly passes to Sun and Fun 2022, four nights in a hotel, a rental car, air show control VIP level access, and the Aerospace Center for Excellence flight deck passes. That is a deluxe package that, uh, well, check out flysnf.org for all the information on how to participate in that raffle. Flysnf.org. Yeah, and there's a lot of levels, so the more tickets you buy, the better chance you have to win. Absolutely. I think we're going back up to Dave Kime right now up in the announcer stand. Dave? Thank you, Larry. Yeah, we are. Uh, earlier, you saw the Kime time of the, uh, the drone and the drone launcher, something unusual on the ramp. I was surprised to learn that that's only been around or has been around already for 10 years. So that's <laughs> something I'd never seen at an air show before. Very interesting. And the thing we're going to talk about now is on about the same time schedule. And it shares a name like the Globemaster 3. Well, this one's a 2. It replaces the venerable T6 Texans and SNJs. Let's hear about the a T6 Texan 2. <laughs> Dave Kime here once again with Kime Time on the Warbird ramp at Sun and Fun. With me is Major John Tyner. He's going to tell us a whole lot about this T-62 aircraft. John? Hey, how are you? How's it going? It's going really well. What should we know about this T-62? So this T-6 Texan II is used uh, for the Air Force and the Navy as well as the primary trainer for both pilots and combat systems officers. So uh, any pilot that goes through, this is going to be the first thing that they're flying once they're done with their initial flight screen. And once they get to their pilot training base, they're going to be flying in this airplane for about six months. And the same thing with the combat systems officer training, which is actually what we do down at Naval Air Station Pensacola. So we train the backseaters. How do you like the uh, Texan? It's an awesome airplane. It's a sports car. Um, so um, it can do a lot of things, and it's a very capable airplane. Really good airplane to train students in. Um, uh, it, it's really great. We take them up. It's fully aerobatic, ejection seats, so, so that students get the opportunity to do all the aerobatics. They get a chance to spin, do all the stalls, all of the things that maybe in a bigger airplane we're not going to be comfortable doing outside of the simulator. Nice. What kind of horsepower you got here? We've got 1,100 horsepower on this airplane, so it's a, it's a little sports car. It, it's, it's a fun airplane to fly, and it's very capable. They give us the keys to a sports car, right, to start off a of flying. Who else can say that? So what better place to learn to fly? 
Yeah, it sounds good to me. I'll tell you what, it's been great talking to you. Hang around and tell all the folks that stop by about this airplane. And that's me, Kime Time, on the ramp. Thanks. To fly in the Air Force nowadays. That's the way you learn to fly in the Air Force. So, to, uh, Steph, I think we're going to take it back to you. Uh, what you got for us? Well, speaking of learning how to fly, thank you very much for that segment, Dave. We do appreciate it. I'm going to embark on the journey of getting my private pilot's license. I'll be doing so in a Vans Aircraft RV-12 with some very, very fancy glass in the cockpit. And so I've had an opportunity to learn about technology and what it can do to help make flying more, give you more information, essentially, when you learn how to fly. I went out to the Garmin booth here, and of course, Sun and Fun exists because of all of the wonderful sponsors and the vendors who come out and show their products to the customers who can come and touch and feel and interact with it. And I had an opportunity to talk to Garmin about some of their latest things they're very excited about. Kyle, what does it mean to a company like Garmin to be back? We are starting to get through this pandemic and you have this opportunity now in your company to see your customers again. Well, first off, thanks for having us on today. I think the big thing for Garmin is we haven't seen our constituent base for 12, 13, 14 months now because of the pandemic. And we're just so happy to be back in front of them, showcasing new products like our GI275 flight instrument, our GTN XI navigators, D2 Air watch and others. We're just so happy to be back in front of the aviation public. I want to ask about something. I'm a student pilot, Kyle, and I am looking at things like Garmin Pilot. And I think one of the things that makes this company successful is the integration across all of its products. Can you speak a little bit about that? You know, Garmin prides itself on being truly an integrated product, being an integrated cockpit, a retrofit cockpit into your airplane, maybe your training airplane that you're going to fly in, or an integrated flight deck like we have in business aviation aircraft and others. Garmin Pilot is another tool that you can carry into the cockpit with you on your iPhone, iPad, or Android device and really bring the Garmin experience and Garmin quality of product into the cockpit with you, but also take it home, do your flight planning, check the weather uh, and everything like that. It's really a great product. Well, there you go. Lots of different things we can do with that. Now, gentlemen, you were watching this piece, and the first thing you said to me is like, okay, little miss. We, we're, <laughs> no, we're, no, I didn't say no, that. He said that. that. <laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> but you, you made a really good point about something that's important to understand. You can be given a lot of information and maybe too much information, and you said to me. I said, after you learn on all the glass stuff, which is absolutely phenomenal, yeah. I'll come out and we'll work and we'll do some needle ball airspeed work. I can't wait. <laughs> I cannot wait. Attitude flying. But I, I and I've got to jump in here. Yes. My RV7A started with a VFR panel when I purchased it. And I decided since I was going to fly it to most of the air shows where I work, I wanted a, a serious panel. I am loaded with Garmin gear. I have dual G3X Touch. I have a 650 so I can shoot an ILS, the autopilot, the remote transponder, the extra radio, the G5 as a backup instrument, and everything. Oh, it's all Garmin, and boy, does that talk great. And Kyle and everybody with Garmin, thanks very much. I'm grateful that I've got that kind of gear to help me fly, fly hard IFR when I need to. But that all those basic airmanship things, you never want to get behind in that exactly. because that'll save your bacon when all else fails. I don't want to be featured on your podcast that you're doing with Flying Magazine, so <laughs> I think right. we're going yeah, right. to learn things the right way. Okay, I'm very excited about this next story. Um, obviously, we have the Blue Angels here. They they are in, as we've been jokingly calling them, the Super Blues and they're Super Hornets. But one of the really cool experiences that very few people get to do is to take a backseat ride along. I had the good fortune to talk to a reporter from WFLA. Her name is Deanne King, and she got to take this ride of a lifetime in the backseat of these new to the team Super Hornets. And we have been given permission from WFLA to bring you her story right now. I want you guys to check this out. Let's see how she did. All right, everybody, second time's the charm. I'm really ready for takeoff. Ready, hit it. Four, five, two, three. So the first thing we're gonna do is some a G warm. We're just gonna get a feel for how our body's gonna respond to G today, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. To the left for two Gs. Real nice and easy. There's two Gs right there. And a little roll to the left. Whoa. Are we rolling? Yep. Are we upside down? 
Yep. What? <laughs> All right, I need like a little break. All right, little breather. Ready. How's that for you? That felt so cool. All right, here we go. Oh, whoa. 0 0.88, 0 0.89, 0 0.9, 91, 92, 93. We're just under the speed of sound. Ready, hit it. Nice job. What did we pull? Seven and a half G's. Yeah, baby! <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's a lot of G's right there. <laughs> Lord, you did it again. <laughs> you the man, Whiskers. You the man. Appreciate that. No pass out. No pass out. And her puke bags were empty. Empty. See, I did it. I kept my word. No puke bags were used. I didn't even pass out. And according to our pilot here, I went 7.5 Gs. I sure did. We're joined now by Whiskers. This is also Lieutenant Julius Brighton. Thank you so much for taking us up. Your persistence, we appreciate everything. Tell the folks what we did up in the air. Yep, absolutely. We did some loops, some rolls. We pulled some Gs and we came back in via an instrument approach. So we did just about everything you can do in an aircraft and, it, and you absolutely dominated it. So nice job. And uh, hopefully everybody comes out to Stone and Fun this weekend, 17 and 18 April. We're looking forward to seeing you guys. Thank you so much, Lieutenant, Br Lieutenant Bratton. I really appreciate it. Y'all heard that I dominated. Dominated, man. All right, I'm Deanne King, eight on your side. Did she like no. that? <laughs> Wait, it, yeah, she had a blast. So I talked to her last night on the phone. If we can, let's go and pull up the photograph that we've got of her. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, well, you know what? I'll go dig it up. The producer was just in my ear saying that they don't have it. It's a selfie that Whiskers took in the cockpit, and she's in the back with a big old smile, and he's in the front, and it's just, it's a fantastic photo. I do want to let you know how you can follow. Oh, we do have it. He's saying, okay, call in an audible. Let's pull it up. There it is. So there it is. You can see what, <laughs> talk about a selfie to end all selfies, right? So for Deanne, uh, just to let you know how you can follow her, you can find her at WFLA. Deanne on Twitter and on Facebook and it just brings me joy to be able to to have someone go through that experience having done it myself it's very special so Deanne thank you to you and to the station for letting us show your story here at Sun and Fun and on the broadcast and as we look at this not everything here at Sun and Fun flies check this out Some people, what idiot built this thing? And I just raised my hand. <laughs> a rat ride uh, is basically, it's a kind of a cult thing that's transpired through a few years where people will build hot rods out of whatever stuff they have laying around. I would probably say for aircraft parts in this, at least 75% aircraft parts. The only automotive parts on this is basically the drive line. Um, everything else was fabricated from scratch. It's basically a therapy car for me because uh, everything I do on 28, you have to be on aircraft. You have to be very precise. This, I formed most everything on my garage floor with a hammer and two by four, and it was just fun to do. It's street legal. Uh, I've actually brought it to the uh, registry of motor vehicles to get it inspected, and they thought it was kind of cool, and they just they gave me my sticker to put in the back of the vehicle, and it's registered and insured. I actually had an aeronautical engineer come up to me and ask me where the plans were for this, and I said none. <laughs> It's just funny. And it's got a license. Uh, it is street legal. <laughs> I saw the plate. <laughs> Give somebody a toolkit full of tools and they'll do anything, you know. Hey, I think it's back to Dave Kime because I think, stand by, ladies and gentlemen, if you're ready for some noise and some speed, it's time for Raptor. <laughs> Yes, Dave. indeed. I, you, know, the, you see the uh, 
the primary is taxiing out. They make a little noise. <laughs> the guy we're going to turn it to makes a lot of noise. I don't know if we're holding the, the primes for the Raptor or the Raptor for the primes at this moment. I haven't heard the air boss say, but I did hear that we're going a little bit early. And there's the P-51 on the takeoff roll. And sitting up here beside me is uh, Master Sergeant George Fagan of the United States Air Force. He's going to tell you all about that Raptor when it's time to go. And he's going to do his full demo, and then you're going to see the Heritage flight. And the good sergeant here is going to tell you all about that when his airplane gets ready to take to the sky. Are you all ready, sir? Just about. Just about, he says. So we're looking to the right, waiting for the Raptor to fire up. And the prime airs are taxiing down. In fact, it looks to me like the prime air may be getting launched right now. Probably got a couple of minutes here before the Raptor is going to take to the sky. What a great day for an air show. What a great week for an air show it's been. Uh, I hear we had a great night show here last night. Any of you folks out there see that? See some hands. Anybody I saw see the it. night show? I saw it, Dave. What would you think? Was that nice? How about the drones? <laughs> Amazing, aren't they? I know Larry was pretty cut, uh, thrilled by the drones. He'd never seen them before. As I was. And they are something else. Fireworks that you can use over, sort of. Ah, yes, we have Prime lining up and waiting. And he's on the roll, so he's going to be going. I imagine they're going to launch both of these guys. And right now, we're just going to stand by and wait. And, and while we do, for six decades, Sporty's Pilot Shop has served pilots all over the world with the finest, most innovative, and necessary supplies to make flying better for you. Founded in 1961, Sporty's has developed the superb pilot training materials, beginning with Hal Shevers teaching and going electronic in 1987 when I started with Sporty's with VH VHS tapes, remember that? <laughs> and then DVDs, then online, and now the award-winning apps. So check sporties.com at slash courses, sporties.com slash courses. And when you buy a course, you get this free lifetime updates. All right, Sporties Pilot Shops. Check out 60th anniversary specials also taking place every week at sporties.com. I hope you'll check it. Dave, I think we got to get maybe one more airplane up and the Raptor. And uh, uh, let me ask George, I don't know whether he can hear me or not. George Fagan, you are, uh, you're a new guy with the Raptor, but you've had some time on some other airplanes as well, haven't you? Yes, sir. The first uh, five years of my career, I was backshop avionics. I was working on target pods for the F-15, the F-16. And the Raptor probably is kind of like the pinnacle of all of the airplanes that you could work on, isn't it? Oh, yeah. There's, uh, it's it's kind of hard to beat a Raptor, you know? <laughs> and the demo, uh, I, I tell you, I got a chance to spend just a very brief time with the former president of the United States, and he told me personally he likes the Raptor. As he should. <laughs> it's our premier fifth-gen fighter jet. <laughs> Thanks, Dave, for letting me punch in and bust up your interview no, on that. No no problem. Uh, <laughs> I'm just waiting for, me, for him to reveal to me all the secrets of the Raptor, because I know they don't tell us everything. And, of course, we wouldn't tell. We just talk about air shows. Just among the two of you. Yeah, just among the guys. I promise I won't post it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. It looks like the Prime Air is ready to go. So we'll have that Raptor in the sky very shortly. The P-51 that we did say take off just a little bit ago is one that's going to participate in the Heritage flight, and George will tell you all about that. But I will say that it is one of the most stirring, patriotic, and kind of emotional moments for uh, uh, for those of us who watch these airplanes fly, the, the, the aircraft from the past with the current Air, sh Air, sh Air Force aircraft that we have. 
I'd have to agree, Rob. It's really a very stirring moment for most people. It, uh, you see the history of the, since World War II up into the present. It's, uh, it's just uh, something you, it's hard to duplicate. I don't know, stirring the emotions it does, I don't know how else you would do that. Yeah, and, it, and Dave, and I agree. It, it, is, it is one of those times that when, when audiences are surveyed after air shows, the Heritage Flight ranks very high in uh, consumer survey response and, uh, and their like, how much they like the different types of acts. Okay, I've been told that we're ready to go here. So Master Sergeant George Fagan, demo team superintendent of the Raptor, take it away, buddy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of your United States Air Force, the commander of Air Combat Command, General Mark Kelly, and all the men and women of Air Combat Command, we welcome you to today's F-22 demonstration. I am F-22 Demo Team Superintendent Master Sergeant George Fagan from Augusta, Georgia, and as a proud member of Air Combat Command's 1st Fighter Wing located at Joint Base langley Eustis in Hampton, Virginia, it is my distinct pleasure to describe for you today a capability demonstration by the most technologically advanced 5th generation fighter aircraft in the world. The F-22 Raptor's mission is air dominance. It supports our joint forces and allies to freely operate in today's joint fight anywhere, anytime. And now, introducing your 2021 F-22 demonstration team from Belchertown, Massachusetts, dedicated crew chief, Technical Sergeant Ian Ivey. From Hubert, North Carolina, Assistant Dedicated Crew Chief, Senior Airman Aaron Bailey. From Bayamon, Puerto Rico, Avionics Technician, Staff Sergeant Fernando Yama. From Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Avionics Technician, Senior Airman Lauren Oag. From New Palestine, Indiana, AFE Specialist, Staff Sergeant Tyler Weinman. From Logan, Utah, Public Affairs Craftsman, Staff Sergeant Don Hudson. From Paso Robles, California, F-22 Demo Team Chief, Technical Sergeant Kevin DeWeese. And our special guest, the 27th Fighter Squadron's very own from Sydney, Maine, avionics technician, Airman First Class, Taylor Edmond. From Vacaville, California, our safety officer and combat ready fighter pilot, Captain Zach Switch Helton. And your 2021 F-22 demonstration fighter pilot with more than 1500 hours flying fighter aircraft. From Tampa, Florida, Major Joshua Cabo Gunderson! You are about to witness the maneuvering capabilities of the most advanced and most lethal fighter aircraft in your United States Air Force. The F-22 you will see today is an unmodified and fully combat capable aircraft. While we can't show you everything that makes the Raptor the most lethal fighter aircraft in the world, we will show you its raw power and thrust vectored maneuvering capabilities as it executes maneuvers that no other fighter aircraft in the world can perform. The Raptor plays a vital role in the defense of this nation and represents your Air Force's dedication to aim high, fly, fight, and win, ensuring our ability to meet any challenge, under any conditions, anytime, anywhere in the world. As today's demonstration begins from your right, you will see the Raptor executing maximum power pulls, producing 70,000 pounds of thrust from its powerful F-119 engines. At a safe altitude, Major Gunners will quickly loop the aircraft, reversing his flight path and then roll while diving straight down. So now it's time to stand up, get ready, because the show is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the most feared aircraft in the world today, your United States Air Force's F-22 Raptor!
powerful engines allow the F-22 to pull more than nine times the force of gravity. Watch from the right as the Raptor demonstrates its tight turn capability with a min radius horizontal turn, and then power straight up into the vertical. The firepower of the Raptor comes in any combination of eight missiles and up to eight precision satellite-guided bombs. The F-22 is the first supersonic, multi-role, and highly agile stealth fighter in the world with a fully internal combat weapons load. Ready your cameras as the Raptor banks in from the left and cycles its weapons bay doors. like to remember our wounded warriors and veterans in attendance and those who have given their lives defending this great nation. This will be your best photo opportunity, so get your cameras ready to capture this salute. Now, from behind and to the right, the F-22 Raptor proudly presents the Dedication Pass. The Raptor will now quickly reposition and show you what the advanced flight controls and engines can do. As it executes the power loop, you will see why the aircraft is unmatched in a vertical fight as it carves through a loop and doubles its altitude at the end. At the top of the loop, you will see the Raptor rotate around one spot in the sky utilizing the vector thrust of two powerful F-119 engines, which literally flip the aircraft through the vertical and back to level flight. Following the power loop, you will see the Raptor perform the loaded roll.
Jets can turn tight. Many Jets can roll quickly. And many Jets can climb fast. But not many can slide. Watch now from behind as the Raptor pulls over, pulls straight up into the vertical, and brings his throttles near idle. And then under complete control, the F-22 Raptor will actually slide backwards. slow speed handling characteristics are phenomenal. Watch now as Major Gunderson repositions the aircraft to crowd right. Reducing the power while loading up on a high angle of attack, the Raptor will slow down to less than 90 knots. After the pass, you'll once again feel the raw power of the jet as Major Gunderson lights those afterburners and climbs straight in the vertical. Ladies and gentlemen, from the right, the Raptor's slow speed pass. possesses the capability to reach speeds and altitudes that make it virtually untouchable, even without using its afterburners. Accelerating from 90 knots to over 600 knots, Major Gunderson will roll inverted in preparation for a split S reposition in a high speed pass, showcasing just a fraction of the aircraft's supercruise and full speed capability. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare for Freedom's Thunder on the high speed pass. The F-22 will now set up to perform a Hoover pitch. This maneuver is a double knife edge separated by an inverted tuck, followed by a pitch to line up in preparation for heritage flight. This will be another great opportunity to capture the, capture the Raptor on your camera during our demonstration. Ladies and gentlemen, named after the late legendary Bob Hoover, the Raptor's Hoover pitch.
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take a moment to describe the unique history of what you are about to watch. In 1997, the leaders of Air Combat Command assembled a select group of retired military and civilian performers to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the United States Air Force. In 2010, the Air Force Heritage Flight Foundation joined with the United States Air Force to keep this popular program flying. From this gathering was born the Heritage Flight, a unique visual representation of Air Force history from the days of the Army Air Corps to the present. What started out as a one-time event has grown in popularity and demand, and now Heritage Flights are performed at air shows and special events in the United States and around the world. Flying in formations today is a World War II era P-51 Mustang piloted by Stuart Milson, A-10 Thunderbolt piloted by Major Hayden Gator Fulham, your United States Air Force's F-22 Raptor piloted by Major Joshua Cabo Gunderson.
we would like to dedicate today's heritage flight to all military veterans in attendance whose sacrifices over the years have helped preserve America's freedom. We hope you enjoy watching this rare formation of classic and current United States Air Force aircraft on our journey from heritage to horizons. Ladies and gentlemen, your United States Air Force Heritage Flight. We hope you've enjoyed watching and taking pride in this rare display of more than 70 years of air power heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, from the right, the F-22 Raptor coming in for a Dan roll. Thank you, dear. Let's see what Gator Fulham's got. There goes the A-10 with the four-point roll. That was awesome. That was the Warbird Heritage Foundation's P-51 Mustang piloted by Mr. Stuart Milson for the four-point roll. Here comes the Raptor again from the right with a tactical pitch.
comes the Mustang again. He's coming by to do a Dan roll. Excuse me, that was the A-10. He just did a slow roll. Here comes the Mustang. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's Raptor demonstration. We hope you've enjoyed this brief display of only a fraction of the F-22's full combat capability. As a key component to the most capable Air Force the world has ever known, your F-22 Raptors are ready to defend our nation's skies and dominate the battle space anywhere on the globe. Ready to aim high, fly, fight, and win. You can see us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at F-22 Demo Team. On behalf of the United States Air Force, the Commander of Air Combat Command, General Mark Kelly, and all the men and women of Air Combat Command, thank you for your attendance, thank you for your patriotism, and thank you for your support. And thank you, Master Sergeant Fagan. Great job you've done up here for the past few days. How about a great big round of applause for the entire F-22 Raptor program, ladies and gentlemen? You bet, let's hear it for him. Great job, guys. Thank you, Dave, and we'll be back to you in just a few minutes as we uh, recover the Raptor and uh, move a couple, other, a couple of other airplanes around. Uh, I do want to take just a moment to say uh, a couple of nice words about the companies and the folks who have made it possible for me to be here at Sun and Fun. And you've heard about the store, Sporties, Pilot Shops. They've been around since 1961 when Hal Shevers started selling radios out of the back of his car. Now they're the largest seller of pilot supplies in the world. But, you have, but have you heard about the courses? We started in 1987 with the video department with VHS tapes, remember those? Then DVDs, then uh, online, and now with the, uh, the apps with total synchronization among apps. Roku, iOS, Android, Apple TV, PC, and, uh, and, and Roku TV. I think I said that. But all of those, if you sign up for a Sporties course, you can do your progress and have it tracked among all those different platforms so you can go from one to the other and not lose a step. And also, you get free lifetime updates with every Sporties Pilot Shop course that you buy. So we invite you to check it out. There's also, and that's sporties.com slash courses. I also want to thank again the folks at Hartzell Propeller Company since 1917, built on honor with the propellers that uh, grace the airplanes that Michael Goulian flies. I'm flying with one. Uh, even Greg Kuntz is flying with one on his Super Decathlon. And compared to the former propeller, he says he can really feel the difference. Hartzell Propeller, built on honor. And earlier we got a chance to uh, meet Lisa DeFries when Stephanie Strickland interviewed her about the I learned about flying from that podcast and I hope you'll join me on that podcast wherever you get your podcasts or go to flyingmag.com and select the drop down menu I laughed podcast it is a deep dive into some of the articles and the stories that have been written by pilots who have gotten into difficult situations and lived to tell about them. And I hope you'll join me for that. Every couple of weeks we have a new episode and it's sponsored by a Vemco Aviation Insurance Company. The I Learned About Flying from that podcast. We all take home something and learn something from it and it's really a very, very, well, it's the most widely read column in the 97 year history of Flying Magazine. So we hope you'll check that out. Stephanie Strickland's over there relaxing just a little bit because we're going to be going back up uh, top very shortly with Dave Kime. But uh, Larry Strain, you've had a number of years here working as one of the lead announcers, and and you travel around the whole country and have for many years, and, and that has earned you a very, very important 
award that I would like to just congratulate oh, you on, and that's the it. International Council of Air Shows Foundation Hall of Fame. You are an inductee into that Hall of Fame, and congratulations well, to thank, you. Thank you very much. The same for Rob Ryder, Sword of Excellence thank winner from much. ICAST. But it is so good to be back to see airplanes flying and people gathering around, photographing, applauding, loving what they're seeing. And I'm loving it that we're back as well. There's a picture close up of the F-22 Raptor. Give him a wave. He's looking around. He can see, Kyle can see us, so it's worth doing that. That's FF for the first fighter wing. You see that on the tail from Joint Base Langley Eustis in uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia. And when they go up to other places like Alaska, they don't take them all the way to, uh, they don't take it all the way uh, to, from Langley. They get a jet up there. But it's time now to go back to Dave Keim for the next part of our show. David, you've got it. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we're going to go back a few years now, back to the wonderful aircraft from the World War II period. Today, we're going to see the B-25 Panchito. He's been given the airfield, so keep your eyes out. We're going to tell you some of the history of this wonderful aircraft. After the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, President Roosevelt ordered the military to devise a plan to attack the Japanese homelands. During the first months of World War II, the news from the Pacific was only of defeat after defeat. The moral of the American public and the military in the Pacific was at its lowest point. Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle was tasked with planning to raid the launch, planning the raid to launch Army B-25 bombers for, from an attack aircraft carrier on Tokyo. Without knowing their target or destination, the 17th Bomb Group volunteered for this top secret mission and began training at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Back then it was Eglin Field. 16 B-25s, 80 men, one mission, payback for Pearl Harbor. The original plan was to launch the B-25s within 300 miles of Japan. The task force was spotted 650 miles out and the decision was made to launch early knowing that after bombing their targets in Japan, the crews might not have enough fuel to reach their designated refueling field in China. No B-25s or crew were lost during the bombing of their targets over Japan. However, one B-25, after dropping its bombs, experienced excessive fuel consumption and turned north, landing in Vladivostok, Russia, where the crew were interned. Fifteen of the B-25s made it to China, but were faced with stormy weather at night. Unable to find the airfield at Chu Chow in the bad weather, the crews bailed out or ditched their aircraft. Two men drowned after ditching. One died when his parachute malfunctioned. Engines were out. Eight people were captured. Three of these were executed by a Japanese firing squad. One died from severe malnutrition. Four came home at the end of the war, rescued by the OSS. They were victims of torture and solitary confinement for three and a half years. 64 raiders found themselves behind Japanese lines in occupied China. Friendly Chinese peasant farmers and militia assisted these men to evade the rampaging Japanese troops. They were humiliated and infuriated by the American bombers bombing their capital. Now from the left on its first pass, imagine the boost in morale of the American public and military. Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle was promoted to Brigadier General and awarded the Medal of Honor. All of the Doolittle Raiders were given the Distinguished Flying Cross. For 71 years, the Raiders held a reunion on their anniversary and the raid and drank a toast to those that are gone from their now famous Silver Goblets. For the past 20 years, Panchito has had the honor of participating in many of these reunions. Today, Panchito flies in honor of those who have gone. That first pass, which we're going to see from left to right there, Panchito show you what the Japanese would have seen on that fateful day in 8, 1942. Listen to that power, the 3,400 horsepower, the sounds of freedom. As Panchito makes its turn back to show center, the crew will show you the business side of the Mitchell bomber. If you have a camera, be prepared to zoom in on the open bomb bay and see the full load of 500-pound demolition bombs. The bombs in Panchito are signed by dozens of B-25 combat veterans who've met over the past 18 years as we travel around the country. 18 of the Doolittle Raiders have signed one of the bombs, and three Raiders have flown Panchito.
tell you a little more about some of the crew and Mr. Larry Kelly, who's behind this operation. Larry's from Enterprise, Alabama, makes his home in Maryland nowadays. He's a pharmacy school graduate from Auburn University. Started flying with his uncle at age nine, earned pilot certificate 42 years ago, added multi-engine commercial instrument and B-25 type ratings, which is handy for flying the B-25. Has 5,500 hours in World War II generation airplanes. He's led formation flights for the Super Bowl and the Indy 500. And now on the left to right path, the B-25 was widely used for low-level dive bombing, especially against Japanese naval targets. Panchito now emulates a dive bombing attack on a Japanese warship. The attacking B-25 would strafe the ship as it approached, then drop a 500 or 1,000 pound bomb on the ship as it passed. And you can experience the thrill of actually piloting Panchito. The Delaware Aviation Museum is offering strike school, pilot school training in, in, uh, on Panchito. If you uh, like dual instruction, the B-25, or if you'd like to learn, earn your second in command type rating or a full type rating, go to DelawareAviationMuseum.org and click on flight training or call 443-458-8926 for details on the next scheduled class. You can stop by Panchito on the Warbird ramp, pick up a brochure, and learn all about that school. Pilots from other countries are welcome as well. All right, on this pass, from right to left, Panchito's crew is approaching for a level bombing run. Watch the bomb bay doors open as he nears show center. The original design of the B-25 was for medium altitude level bombing, but as we will describe on the next pass, crews uh, changed that around just a little bit. Turned the B-25 into a much more decent weapon. I was saying uh, Larry Kelly has led formation flights for the Super Bowl, the Indy 500, the Preakness race, multi NASCAR races. He's the first civilian allowed to fly over Arlington Cemetery after the 9-11 attacks. He's appeared on History Channel and the Military Channel, written for many aviation books, organized flight lead for large B-25 formations, the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders for the past 22 years. For 10 years, Larry represented the DAV, Disabled American Veterans, as flight team lead. Now from the left, that level pass. your cameras ready folks I believe on this next pass it's going to be a photo opportunity we'll check and see the B-25 had up to 14 forward firing machine guns for striping ground targets it made B-25 a very effective ground attack airport or airplane Imagine four B-25s approaching a Japanese airfield at treetop height, 335 miles per hour with 56 50 caliber machine guns blazing, as well as parafrag bombs raining down. There you go, beautiful photo pass. Get those cameras clicking. Again, remember, you can fly Panchito. You can get a second command rating. You can get a type rating in Panchito. Talk to the good folks up the Delaware Flight Museum, and they will set you up. Okay, if you missed it the first time, get those cameras ready, folks. Panchito's coming back around for its final pass, giving you one more chance to get that signature photograph. Again, if you've ever wanted to fly a B-25, this is your chance in your airplane. Complete details of the flight school can be found on their website, 
at www.delawareaviationmuseum.org and click on flight training. The crew flying today is pilot Captain Sabrina Kipp, co-pilot Captain Sid Jones, crew chief Rich Applebaum, and of course we have Larry Kelly. Panchito, ladies and gentlemen, get those cameras clicking. They've been cleared to land after this photo pass. And what a great show they put on for you today, reliving history with the B-25. But we've got more to come yet. Indeed we do. As soon as Panchito gets on the ground, Paul Daugherty will be back with his Kristen Eagle, not to be confused with the Pitts. And his lovely daughter Caroline's up here and she'll tell you all about it when the time comes here. She's got a lot of aviation cred herself, as a matter of fact. 19 years old and you have all those ratings. That's right, I am 19. I am currently a sophomore at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach. And just recently I earned my instrument commercial and CFI in addition to engineering. Well, where's the CFI I? Come on, you're slacking on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this summer I'm hoping to get my multi-engine rating and MEI. There you go, so. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I assumed it was going to be there somewhere. So. Somewhere, yep, it's, it's on the lineup. Yeah, that's good. Keep up the good work. Thank you. There you go. Aviation runs deep at Sun and Fun. Everybody has got some attachment to it, some more than others. Obviously, Caroline has a pretty good <laughs> attachment that runs deep. I do, yes. I pretty much got my aviation passion from my dad. We live on a small grass strip up in Pennsylvania, and my bedroom window actually overlooks the airport, or overlooks the runway. So I'd wake up as a kid to the sound of an airplane and look out my bedroom window and see what was taking off. There you go. That doesn't get much better than that, huh? Yeah, it really doesn't. You didn't ride a big wheel. You were looking for airplanes. <laughs> as Panchito approaches its taxiway, that will open the airport again for Mr. Daughtry. Airboss is staying a little bit busy. A lot of these performers are trying to vacate before that weather gets here to see if they can get around that, so. Yeah, they are. I know my dad, as soon as we can get out of here today after the show, we're gonna get packed up and try to beat the weather back. Well, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you have weather radar on the pits. Yes. Or on the, yeah. not the pits. That's the ice. Yeah, the Kristen Eagle. Yeah, the Kristen Eagle. <laughs> the Kristen Eagle is actually designed in 1977 as an alternative to the pit special. Yeah, they made quite a splash when they first came out back in the day. Mm -hmm. Yep, they came out as kits. Yeah, and the so Kristen Eagle's flight team. Mm -hmm. Yep. Quite the deal. You don't see many of them around nowadays. It's refreshing to see one out here flying. I love the paint scheme. Thank you. Yeah, it actually features 17 different color shades, ranging from red, orange, and yellow. <laughs> so it's a very unique Kristen Eagle. A lot of the ones, they will be white, but ours is a little bit more unique with the black color scheme. Yeah, they always had kind of a feathery scheme of some nature on the paint, but uh, mm -hmm. this one's really nice. Thank you. We have someone on the takeoff roll. I'm not sure who it is. I could be wrong. It was someone like Okay, the smoke is on. Cue the music. He's been flying airships since 1998 and has logged over 24,000 hours in the sky. President and co-founder of the Golden Age Air Museum, he is here to perform for you today in the Kristen Eagle biplane. From Bethel, Pennsylvania, my dad, Paul Doherty. And he starts off his routine today with a half Cuban 8, but he's going to mix it up a little bit. Let's see what he decides to do on the 45 down line. And he does a triple snap roll on that 45 down. I asked Paul yesterday when he went to his first air show as a kid, and he said he actually didn't know. He's probably about six or seven years old. And his dad took him, and from that point on, he knew he belonged in the sky. 
Right now, he pulls to the vertical and snaps it over the top. This is one of our signature maneuvers. We call it the snappy thingy. Really unique, right? Well, we didn't know what to call it, and what else suits it better? Paul started taking flying lessons when he was 17, and he got his private pilot's license, quickly followed by the rest of his ratings and endorsements. He got his commercial when he was 19 years old and now has an ATP and AMP license so he can work on his own airplane. Oh, right now he's pushing negative outside the cockpit. So right now you and I are doing one positive G. That means we have one force of gravity acting on us. When he rolls inverted, he has negative one Gs on us. And as soon as he pushes forward, he gets pushed out of the seat. All the blood is rushing into his head. purchased this Kristen Eagle back in 2015 after it was damaged in a landing accident. But Paul said, hey, we can fix this. So he purchased the airplane and restored it himself over an eight month period. So right now, Paul is gonna do the tail slide for us, which means he pulls vertical until he runs out of complete vertical energy and the airplane actually flies backwards through the sky. And it just flips right back around and continues on flying. During that maneuver, the airspeed reads zero because he's actually flying backwards. Paul is the president and co-founder of the Golden Age Air Museum, which is a small nonprofit flying museum that he and his dad started. They started off with the Cessna 195, and now the museum has over 40 vintage aircraft. The museum's primary for focus is World War I planes and the planes from the Golden Age of Aviation, which is the time between World War I and World War II. So Paul is coming back into the box here. It looks like he's gonna do an ordinary barrel roll for us. But wait, he snaps it over the top. We call that the barrel avalanche. A traditional avalanche is a big old round loop with a snap roll on top. But this, we took the combination of the avalanche and a barrel roll. One of the airplanes that Paul restored at the Golden Age Air Museum was a 1917 Curtis Jenny. He and his dad restored this over an eight year period. And me, when I was learning how to fly, my dad was actually my flight instructor, which was an amazing experience for me. And when I turned 16, he actually let me make my first solo flight in his precious 1917 Curtis Jenny. I was very, very relieved when I brought that back without a scratch. That is his prized possession. In addition to the Kristen Eagle, Paul also flies air shows in a 1930 Great Lakes trainer. That airplane's a lot slower, so we typically don't fly it that far away from home. It's primarily doing shows up in Pennsylvania, but the Kristen Eagle is our traveling air show airplane. So in just a few moments, we're gonna see if we can go live to the cockpit with Paul and see how he's doing up there. Right now, he's just completing the second half of a Cuban 8. Hey, Paul, how's it going up there? Hey, Caroline, I'm having a great time. How is it down there? We're having a blast. We love watching you fly. All right, here's a good full vertical. Hey, I'd like to cut a few shout outs here to uh, Sudden Paul. What a great show. We are thrilled to be part of it. Another shout out for the Aerospace Center for Excellence. What a great organization doing a lot of good. Folks, this is all for that. We appreciate it. Another shout out for the volunteers. Boy, without the, the volunteers this week, we never would have had this beautiful show. It was great to see it come back. So the one last shout out is goes to my crew. Caroline, to you, my crew chief, my announcer, my business partner. Thank you, I love you. And the rest of my crew, Melissa and Emily, love you guys too. So here we Okay, Paul, can you still hear us? Your microphone cut out there a little bit. Are you ready for your next maneuver? Well, I'm gonna tell you anyway. We're gonna head back inbound. This maneuver was created in 1972 by Mr. Charlie Hillard. He did it in the 1972 World Aerobatic Competitions. All the judges and One eagle pilot to another. 
Okay, so Paul's transmission got a little bit choppy there, but what he was trying to say is that he is talking about his next maneuver that he is going to do, which is going to be the torque roll. This maneuver was introduced in 1972 uh, by Charlie Hiller, Charlie Hillard in an aerobatic uh, competition, and Paul would like to dedicate this maneuver to him. So what a torque roll is, is he pulls vertical and he starts rolling that air clean. He keeps rolling it until he runs out of vertical energy. And at the top, he's actually gonna back up just like he did in the tail slide. But it, there will be a point in this maneuver where the torque from the propeller takes over and he actually starts rotating the other direction. It was a beautiful torque roll. He backed up a ton. When Paul isn't flying air shows, you can find him volunteering at the Golden Age Air Museum. Right now, he is restoring a, or right now, he's building a replica of a SPAD 13 World War I aircraft with a team of restoration specialists. He also enjoys sailing. He has a sailboat on the Chesapeake Bay where he spends his pastimes. And he is also an airline pilot for a major airline flying a Boeing 737. He has to somehow be able to support the financial needs to do air shows. He's flown over 70 different types of aircraft. One of them is actually a DR-1 Fokker triplane. He actually built this World War I replica himself, and it actually has a rotary engine on it, which makes it very unique. So Paul's coming back into the box. This is another one of Paul's favorite maneuvers. He starts rolling on the 45 upline and then cross controls that airplane, pushing, pushing. This is called the Lump Shavak. If you come visit us up in Pennsylvania at the Golden Age Air Museum, we give biplane rides in the 1929 Waco, where you could actually fly with Paul. Unfortunately, we can't take you upside down on this vintage airplane, but it is a beautiful ride where you can see the Pennsylvania countryside. So this Kristen Eagle is a 230 horsepower airplane, a little four-cylinder engine. It weighs 1,100 pounds empty, which makes it a little bit heavier than the Pitts S1, which is one of its competitors back in the day. And he comes back into the box. Let's see, it looks like he's gonna do a big old round loop, but he snaps it over the top, not once, but twice. This is called the double avalanche. What he's doing next for us is this is going to be called the Humpty Bump Maneuver. This maneuver is primarily used in aerobatic competitions where the pilots are judged on their ability to fly precise aerobatics. He pushes it up over the top. Paul would also like to take a moment to thank his sponsors. We have JPI Instruments out of Huntington Beach, California, the leader in engine data management. The Eagle features the new EDM350 engine data management system, monitoring engine parameters, allowing Paul to concentrate on the task of precision flying. So when Paul restored this airplane, the landing gear actually destroyed the bottom wings. It collapsed through. Now when Paul got this, he actually had to match the top wing colors to the bottom wing colors when he repainted this thing. And he did it all by eye, just mixing different colors, trying to get the perfect match. I do not know how he did it, but he did an amazing job because this airplane is beautiful. He comes back around doing a beautiful rolling pass. I believe Paul is going to do another photo pass for you, so this will be your last chance to get a beautiful photo of this airplane flying. This is actually our first year performing at Sun and Fun. We had our debut performance yesterday, and it was an honor to be able to, to perform here for you. It is a dream come true for us. So thank you once again for having us.
Danny comes back around. Get your cameras ready. 17 different colors on that airplane. We hope you enjoyed our father-daughter performance today. If you'd like to find out more about Dockerty Air Shows, you can visit us on Facebook at Dockerty Air Shows or visit our website at DockertyAirShows.com. If you have any pictures or videos from today's performance, feel free to send them to us. We would love to share them with everyone. Once again, thank you to all the volunteers making the show possible, and we hope we can return for you again next year. And I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. How about a great big round of applause for Paul Dockerty and his daughter Caroline? for telling us all about it. Thank you, young lady. Thank you. And welcome to Sun and Fun. It's a pleasure to be here. All right then, Rob. Did you know that Geico's whole 15 minutes thing, <laughs> that came from me. Really, my first idea was in one quarter of an hour, your savings will tower. Uh, over you, figuratively speaking. But that's not catchy, is it? It's not going to swim about in your brain. So I thought, what about 15 minutes, 15%? Serendipity. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. We are just a few minutes away from turning every blade of grass <laughs> and every molecule of air over to the United States Navy's Flight Demonstration Squadron. But before we do, we got some people we want to thank. Stephanie? On behalf of Sun and Fun, for everyone watching the broadcast around the world, we want to give a sincere thank you to Live Air Show TV, the team that comes together to put this on for everyone to be able to watch, even out here on the field on the big screen. So thank you very much, Live Air Show TV. How many countries do you know right, right away? I don't. I, we had 82 yesterday. Wow. Wow. And we uh, want to thank Onboard Images, all of these spectacular shots that you see from not only inside but outside the airplanes with cameras mounted on the tail, on the wingtip. Great shots. And also a great big thank you to Jay Rabbit and Nick and Cody from, uh, from Air Show One, the best sound guys in the air show business. They have made my life so wonderful as I travel around the country doing shows and working with those guys. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Cody. And thank you, Sporties. Thank you, Hartzell. Thank you, <laughs> Flying Magazine, for the podcast. And we're minutes away. So what else do we have to discuss here before the Blues get it? So the, they're going to take over at exactly 3.30. What's the, do we know the exact 15.30? Well, that's what I'm hearing from our Airboss George Klein, which means according to my little wristwatch here, that's about six minutes or five minutes and 40, 38, 37 seconds away. So we'll talk right into it. Why don't we talk about low shows, medium and high shows that that's you know idea. very much about and, and what we might see today. Let's, let's do that. Right now, I, I checked with the tower a little bit ago and they said there were f scattered clouds at 4,200 feet. The Blue Angels will never go into a cloud intentionally. That's the point. When they 
are flying in such close formation with literally 18 inch wingtip to canopy separation, clouds are a bad thing to be flying into. So they will do what is called a low show. They will not do the highest maneuvers, which require, I think, 8,000 feet for a high show. So we'll see a lower show, but it will not take away from the excitement, the noise, the drama, and the demonstration of the incredible capabilities of these F-18 Super Hornet aircraft. Yeah. The, most performers here will fly with the three mile visibility as well, but not the blues. They must have five mile visibility, forward visibility in order to fly in addition to that ceiling. That's very true. There are, there are rules that are very important uh, that are set by the FAA. And Larry, as, a, as not only as an announcer, but you as an air boss have to, have to communicate that to all the pilots that these minimums of, well, it's, is it 15? Typically 1,500 feet from the surface to the bottom of the of lowest clouds. Cloud. Yes, yes. 1,500 then, feet, but we can we can do a show to th if the FAA would allow it at 1,003 if if they feel comfortable doing that. So that's 1,000 foot clearance from the ground to the lowest clouds. And Correct. When you say three, three statute miles, miles. visibility horizontal. Correct. Yes. So that's that's basic VFR for for a, a, a normal private pilot to fly in. So they're not going to go any less than that. You don't go into a cloud. As a matter of fact, that even applies for most of the skydiving teams. If they can't see the target, they're not going to jump out of the airplane. <laughs> we want to take just a quick second and, and show you guys, take you back to a story we ran earlier. You can actually see the selfie from the WFLA reporter. That right oh, there yes. is Deanne King. And we did show you the story earlier, but I highly recommend you go check it out if you're just getting here a little bit later to the airfield or if you're just joining the broadcast because her reactions as she flew back seat as what I believe is the first uh, reporter, the first media person to take a ride in the wow. Super Hornets, right? In the new That's the right. new to the team Super Hornets. I think she would be the first. And watching her reaction as she pulled a whole heck of a lot of G uh, was definitely an experience to see. So did do you, check uh, that out. Did you stay awake during your ride? I did stay awake, and I was younger then, so I also did not get sick. That has since changed. I took a nap. <laughs> I took a nap. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, punishing. These Super Hornets. Hornets are actually an extension of, of, of a, a aircraft design that goes back to the 70s because in the 1970s when the Air Force was looking for a new lightweight fighter they were they were looking at two different competitors Northrop had the YF-17 the General Dynamics Corporation had the YF-16 well the YF-16 became the F-16 Fighting Falcon and then the YF-17 we thought was going to be scrapped or scrapped or put into some dark corner of an obscure aviation uh, museum, but the Navy needed something to replace their F-4 Phantoms, the McDonnell right. Douglas Phantoms, and they saw the design of this YF-17, two motors, they liked it. It became the F-A-18 Super Hornet, uh, uh, the F-A-18 Hornet, Hornet the yes. legacy Hornet, and the Blues flew it for 33 years. And then when the F-14 Tomcat, the star of the movie Top Gun, uh, when that airplane was ending, nearing the end of its service life, they looked to that proven design of the Hornet and built the Super Hornet. 30% larger, four of 10,000 pounds more uh, thrust uh, for the airplane. So what we'll hear and see today will pound our chests. 30%. Uh, larger and about 8,000% louder. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it was a bit of a surprise to me. I knew it was going to be loud, but when you see all of those jets together in formation, ooh, just prepare yourselves for it. So if you've got little kids, uh, just just know that it's it's louder than what you might be used to if you've seen the Blue Angels fly before. Hopefully, yeah. you're using everybody's using hearing protection <laughs> like we are. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but uh, it's exciting also to see how how much less afterburner they used during the show than they did with the regular Hornet. The Super Hornet got so much more power, and I was told that during the 3G, uh, the, excuse me, the, the uh, what, what's my, uh, what was my, I lost my train there, the, the 360 the circle. Diamond, the, yes. Yes. Yeah, the 360 yeah. circle, uh, which is a high G maneuver. I was told it can't stay in burner in that, not due to the airplane, but it'll put the pilot out. Too many Gs. Yeah. Which and that's that, saying something. They know how to pull G. <laughs> it is. They, they work very hard at <laughs> they it. Do. We are just very, very short time away from introducing the blues. And, uh, and uh, the, the guy you're going to hear talk in just a moment has turned out to be a super good friend. Absolutely. And uh, let me just ask everybody, you ready for the Blue Angels? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sort of. The oh, next voice you on. hear will be that of the narrator for the Blue Angels. He is Lieutenant Julius Bratton from Woodlawn, Tennessee. It is with great pleasure that I present to you your United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron, the Blue Angels. Hit it. The Blue Angels would like to dedicate today's air show to the late Brett Krause. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Your United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron takes pleasure in performing for you. This is our second flight demonstration of the 2021 season. I'm Lieutenant Julius Bratton, narrator for the Blue Angels. Since 1946, the Blue Angels have had the unique privilege of demonstrating to the American public the precision techniques of naval aviation, hoping to inspire a culture of excellence and service to country. The maneuvers you will see demonstrated here this afternoon are coordinated tactical techniques developed by Navy and Marine Corps pilots in both peacetime training and actual combat. These maneuvers are neither stunts nor daring feats, but are refinements of basic techniques taught to every prospective naval aviator. Here at Lakeland, Florida, we will demonstrate these maneuvers at very low altitude in traditional Blue Angel formation so that you may see and take pride in the precise fashion in which your Navy and Marine Corps pilots are trained to fly. Now, direct your attention to the ramp before you. Observe the military manner in which the five demonstration pilots approach their aircraft and are saluted by their crew chiefs. Ladies and gentlemen, flying Blue Angel number one, the commanding officer and flight leader of the Blue Angels from Fargo, North Dakota, Commander Brian Kesselring. Flying Blue Angel number two, the right wingman from Canadian, Texas, Lieutenant Commander James Haley. Flying Blue Angel number three, the left wingman from Kingwood, Texas, Major Frank Zastapil. Flying Blue Angel number four, the slot pilot from Chesapeake, Virginia, Lieutenant Commander Jim Cox. Flying Blue Angel number five, the lead solo from Reading, Pennsylvania, Commander Ben Walborn. As the crew chiefs assist the pilots into their jets, you are witnessing the teamwork found in all Navy and Marine Corps units, Marine Corps values of honor, courage, and commitment. For more information on our support crew and our pilots, we invite you to follow the team on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There you will find exclusive photos and videos, as well as a behind the scenes look at our organization and how we operate. The Navy's Flight Demonstration Squadron, the Blue Angels, is the oldest performing U.S. military aviation demonstration team. Since 1946, the Blue Angels have brought naval aviation to men and women of all ages across America. We were first based at Naval Air Station Jacksonville, Florida, flying F-6F Hellcats. We continued flying Grumman Corporation aircraft for 22 years, transitioning in late 1946 to the more powerful and faster F-8F Bearcat. In 1950, we transitioned to jet aircraft with the straight wing F9F2 Panther, the predecessor of the swept wing F9F8 Cougar, which we received in 1955. In 1957, the Blue Angels became equipped with high performance aircraft with the arrival of the supersonic F11F Tiger. In 1969, we received the McDonnell Douglas Phantom and flew this supersonic jet until 1974 when we transitioned to the A4 Skyhawk. In 1987, we acquired the F18 Hornet and demonstrated its reliability over 34 show seasons. 
We are now in our first year of flying the combat-proven Boeing F-A-18 Super Hornet. The pilots and crew chiefs will now start the general electric engines that power the F-18. The noise level will soon become too high for you to hear a description of the checks they will be performing. However, please note that each aircraft was carefully inspected by expert Blue Angel maintenance personnel prior to this afternoon's aerial demonstration. The Blue Angels fly the Boeing F-A-18 Super Hornet, a multi-mission strike fighter, versions of which have been operational throughout the fleet since 2001.
and perform here this afternoon. This degree of precision has been a trademark of the Blue Angels since first established 75 years ago. 17 officers and 140 enlisted personnel comprise the Navy's Flight Demonstration Squadron. Pilots 1 through 4 fly in the Diamond Formation, showcasing the precision flying required of Navy and Marine Corps aviators, while pilot number 5 flies as a solo, demonstrating the maximum performance capability of the aircraft. Once again, I'm Lieutenant Julius Bratton from Woodlawn, Tennessee, Blue Angel number 7 and the narrator for the flight demonstration, as well as the pilot for the key influencer and media personnel we normally fly to each show site. Blue Angel number eight, Lieutenant Caitlin Forster from Scottsdale, Arizona, is the Squadron Naval Flight Officer and Events Coordinator. Commander Todd Royals from Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, serves as the Squadron Executive Officer. Our Marine Corps C-130 pilots are Major Rick Rose from Napa, California, Captain Austin Huckaba from Hoover, Alabama, and Captain Jackson Strife from Omaha, Nebraska. Lieutenant Brian Abe, our maintenance officer from Richardson, Texas, is responsible for the men, women, and equipment that keep our aircraft flying. From Juana Diaz, Puerto Rico, our assistant maintenance officer is Lieutenant Henry Cedeno. From Virginia Beach, Virginia, the Blue Angel flight surgeon is Lieutenant Monica Borza. From Sedalia, Missouri, our supply officer is Lieutenant Kristen Tolan. From Rochester Hills, Michigan, our public affairs officer is Lieutenant Chelsea Dietlin. Our Boeing technical representatives are Mr. Jack Rao from Fort Worth, Texas, Mr. Todd Lawson from Tigard, Oregon, and Mr. Landy Harnishbeeger from Nantucket, Massachusetts. Our financial management analysts are Mrs. Deborah Valentino from Hazard, New Jersey, and Mrs. Deborah Johnson from Pensacola, Florida. The five demonstration pilots are approaching the end of the runway to begin their takeoff sequence. Very shortly, Commander Kelsering will call for the four diamond pilots to take fingertip formation. In this formation, Blue Engine number four, the slot pilot, will be positioned to outboard of Blue Engine number two on the right wing. From there, they'll initiate their takeoff roll, transition to the diamond on liftoff, and commence the diamond burner go on takeoff. As the diamond clears the flight line, the solo pilot will begin his takeoff maneuver. In a dynamic display of the thrust produced by these General Electric engines, Commander Walborn will roll Blue Angel number five 360 degrees immediately after takeoff with the landing gear still extended.
Now to the right. Commander Kesselring calls, smoke on, off brakes now, burners ready now, and the Blue Angel Diamond is rolling. As they pass before you, you'll notice that the smoke is no longer visible while the engines are in afterburner. The smoke comes on as Commander Kesselring calls for the deselection of Afterburner by the four Diamond Pilots. Back to the right, Blue Angel number five is rolling and will complete the dirty roll on takeoff. The Blue Angel Diamond will momentarily be making its approach from the right. In relatively slow speed flight, they'll give you an opportunity to get a close look at the precision flying that produces the 18-inch wingtip to canopy separation between these four aircraft. From the right, the Blue Angel Diamond. A sensation of weightlessness or ballistic flight, similar to that experienced by astronauts in space, will now be felt by the solo pilot. Approaching center point, Commander Walborn will roll his aircraft to 90 degrees angle of bank and push forward on the stick as he performs the knife edge pass. The Diamond is approaching for a maneuver that is likely familiar to those of you who have seen the Blue Angels perform in the past. From the right, at 400 miles per hour, the Diamond Roll. All four aircraft flying as one in this graceful 360 degree rolling maneuver. The solo pilot will next demonstrate the inverted flight capability of the F-18. Approaching inverted from the right, he will roll his aircraft 360 degrees crossing over center point. Ladies and gentlemen, the inverted to inverted roll.
To the left, the Diamond is setting up for their next maneuver. Approaching center point, on Commander Kelsering's command, all four pilots will simultaneously roll their aircraft 360 degrees as they perform the Diamond Aileron Roll. Here's Commander Kesslering. Aircraft pilots and enthusiasts who appreciate the difficulties associated with carrier aviation will enjoy this next maneuver demonstrated by the solo pilot. To the right, Commander Walborn will establish himself in the inverted position. However, look closely as his aircraft is in the carrier landing configuration as he approaches for a maneuver we call the Ford. Four Navy and Marine Corps pilots who must land their aircraft on the small and sometimes pitching deck of an aircraft carrier at sea, slow speed flight is just as important as high speed flight. In order to demonstrate the dirty, slow speed handling characteristics of the F-18, Commander Kesslering has called for the extension of the landing gear and tail hooks by the four Diamond pilots as they execute a maneuver performed by no other jet demonstration team in the world today. From the left, the Diamond Dirty Roll. To the left, Commander Walborn is approaching to demonstrate the maximum performance turn radius of the F-18. He'll execute a 7.5G afterburning turn and exit the flight line vertically, showcasing the Super Hornet's turbo nose load capability. approach once again, you should notice two significant modifications. While the wingman, Lieutenant Commander Haley and Major Zastapil maintain minimum wingtip to canopy separation, the flight leader and slot pilot are both in the inverted position. From the right, the Blue Angel double farvel.
formed a behind the crowd sneak. Blue Angel number five will complete the maneuver with this series of vertical rolls. The four Diamond Pilots are now stacked down and aft on a 45 degree bearing line to establish a right echelon formation. From the right, at 378.5 miles per hour, the Blue Angel Echelon Parade. Setting up for his next maneuver, Blue Angel number five is converging on center point to demonstrate the rapid roll rate of the F-18's fly-by-wire flight control system. Crossing center point, he'll complete two consecutive rolls totaling 720 degrees, the horizontal rolls. To the left, Commander Kesselring is calling for a formation change, shifting the wingman into a left echelon formation. Approaching at 400 miles per hour, the Blue Angel left echelon flat pass. to the right. Observe as the three wingmen smoothly shift back into the Blue Angel Diamond. Now that Blue Angel number five has your attention, you have seen firsthand the ability of a tactical aircraft at high speed to sneak into a target area virtually undetected. Commander Wobblin will complete the maneuver as he joins with the Diamond to the right. To the right, Commander Walborn has joined the Diamond in a line of rest formation. Still maintaining minimum separation, the pilots must now align themselves by looking 90 degrees from their flight path towards Commander Kesselring's aircraft. Approaching from the right at 350 miles per hour, the five plane line of rest flat pass.
as they exit to the left. Commander Kesslering calls for another formation change prior to detaching Blue Angel number five. You have seen several flight profiles of the F-18. The solo pilot will next demonstrate precision roll rate control. Approaching center point, he will roll his aircraft 360 degrees, pausing after each 90 degrees of rotation, crossing center point in the inverted position. The four point hesitation roll. From behind the crowd, Commander Kesslering is rolling out the diamond formation for another dynamic maneuver, the low break cross. Approaching center point, the entire formation will separate in an individual fashion. As each aircraft accelerates to 500 miles per hour, they'll perform a reversal turn back towards the flight line. You should be able to follow their individual smoke trails as all four aircraft converge on center point with maximum closure and minimum separation. From the right, Blue Angel number five is approaching for a parade pass, flown at 500 miles per hour. In front of the crowd to the left, the Diamond is rolling out to demonstrate the awesome power of these General Electric F414 engines. Let's listen as Commander Kessler calls for the selection of afterburner by the four Diamond pilots. As they pass over center point, you will hear and feel the thunder of eight engines producing 168,000 pounds of thrust.
To the right, Commander Walborn is approaching to demonstrate the slow speed handling characteristics of the Super Hornet in the clean configuration. He'll pass before you, virtually standing Blue Angel number five on his tail. At less than 120 miles per hour, the fly-by-wire flight controls provide the slow speed handling that sets the Super Hornet apart in the air-to-air -air combat arena. Ladies and gentlemen, the High Alpha Pass. The Blue Angels, home-based in Pensacola, Florida, completed an intensive winter training period at Naval Air Facility El Centro, California. The beautiful weather of the Imperial Valley provided us with the optimum conditions to fly each of the demonstration pilots on the 120 training flights necessary prior to our first public demonstration. Our show season opened yesterday and runs through early November. The Blue Angels will perform 52 flight demonstrations this season while visiting 29 cities throughout the United States and Canada. The next portion of our flight demonstration will showcase all five aircraft flying together in formation. The Blue Angel Delta has been our signature six-plane formation since 1958. Behind the crowd to the right, the solo pilot has joined the Diamond to form the Blue Angel Delta. From the right, at 200 miles per hour, the slow speed Delta flat pass. All four wingmen maintaining position as they slowly pass over center point. As they exit to the left, observe as Commander Kesselring brings the formation back towards the flight line. Very shortly, all five aircraft will be approaching for the Blue Angel maneuvering Delta.
from the left at 400 miles per hour. All five aircraft are approaching for the maneuvering Delta. As they pass over center point, you should get a good look at the Delta set used by the four wingmen. For a description of our maneuvers, as well as an in-depth look at our team and individual biographies, we invite you to visit our website and follow us on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. In front of the crowd, the Delta is making their approach to the flight line. Approaching center point, the entire formation will separate in dramatic fashion. Ladies and gentlemen, the Blue Angel Delta Breakout. Ladies and gentlemen, your United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron represents a time-honored tradition of pride, professionalism, and excellence spanning 110 years of naval aviation. The 2021 team takes a great deal of pride in saluting Navy and Marine Corps aviators, maintenance crews, and support personnel everywhere. From the left, your 2021 Blue Angels. One of the unique demands placed upon naval aviators is that they be able to land their aircraft on a ship at sea, whether it be a tactical jet, 
a propeller-driven aircraft, or a helicopter. Each requires skill which the naval aviator must master. In order to perfect this skill, Navy and Marine Corps pilots spend a great deal of time in the landing pattern practicing carrier approaches. In front of you now, Commander Kesselring and his wingman are demonstrating a simulated carrier pattern. Approaching the runway from the left, Commander Kesselring is confirming that the landing checks have been completed and that each aircraft is in fact ready to land. Rolling out on final, they'll make constant power and lineup corrections, maintaining the optimum rate of descent for the proper touchdown point. The demonstration pilots you've been watching perform here this afternoon are but a small part of the Blue Angel team. The men and women in blue uniforms standing before you are members of the elite Blue Angel maintenance crew. Through hard work, many long hours, and unselfish dedication, they have each year, for the past 75 years, provided us with the aircraft availability necessary to perform each of these flight demonstrations. As the aircraft taxi back, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the Blue Angel maintenance crew. Command Master Chief Eric McDermott from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Maintenance Master Chief James Hernandez from Norwalk, California. Maintenance Chiefs Aaron Sly from Glen Rose, Texas. Clint Smothers from Benton, Kentucky. Crew Coordinator Jeff Jejus from Go Naives, Haiti. Crew Chief Number One Jeremy Race from Severn, Maryland. First Mech Paint Shop Jerry Rumbaugh from Picos, Texas. Crew Chief Number Two Alice Gutierrez from San Antonio, Texas. First Mech Life Support Jack Reynolds from Moss Bluff, Louisiana. Crew Chief Number Three Ryan Johnson from Pensacola, Florida. First Mech Life Support, Jerry Kalo from Independence, Kentucky. Crew Chief Number Four, David Bloom from Nashville, Tennessee. First Mech Airframe, Sam Smith from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Crew Chief Number Five, Trevor Newalk from Wichita, Kansas. First Mech Power Plants, Eileen Kupka from Linden, New Jersey. Crew Chief Number Six, Sharon Gallup from Valdosta, Georgia. First Mech Power Plants, Michael Donaldson from Ripon, California. Crew Chief Number Seven, Nathan Lyons from Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Runway Truck Alert Crew, Elliot Moore from Bandera, Texas. Adam Wilbert from Louisville, Kentucky. Clint Blakemore from Sand Springs, Oklahoma. Trey Bosler from Milford, New Hampshire. Caleb Davis from Cincinnati, Ohio. Quality Assurance Representative Matt Mojica from El Paso, Texas. Aerospace Medicine Technician Amelia Hauseman from San Antonio, Texas. Public Affairs Representative Cody Hendricks from Beaufort, South Carolina. Video Technicians Dustin Clover from St. Louis, Missouri. Julia Damascolo from California City, California. Logistics Support Representatives Gregory Lloyd from Murphy, North Carolina. Vincent Smith from Jacksonville, North Carolina. Maintenance Control Representative Alex Wittemann from Prescott, Arizona. Music Choreographer Kyle Wood from Orange City, Florida. C-130 Crew Mike Burgess from Crown Point, Indiana. Chris Maxheimer from Mount Pulaski, Illinois. Maintenance Support Personnel Cameron Cowan from Dayton, Texas. Colin Palmer from Bend, Oregon. Joshua Boone from Roanoke, Virginia. Cameron Ferguson from Commerce, Georgia. And Travis Nolan from Carrollton, Alabama. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, your 2021 Blue Angel Maintenance Crew.
Taxiing just off to your right, the Blue Angels will momentarily be turning into the parking area. As they step away from the aircraft, or as they taxi back rather, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the demonstration pilots you've been watching perform here this afternoon. It has been an honor and our pleasure to perform for you here at Lakeland, Florida. This is our second flight demonstration of the 2021 season. Ladies and gentlemen, flying Blue Angel number five, the lead solo from Reading, Pennsylvania, Commander Ben Walborn. Flying Blue Angel number four, the slot pilot from Chesapeake, Virginia, Lieutenant Commander Jim Cox. Flying Blue Angel number three, the left wingman from Kingwood, Texas, Major Frank Zastapil. Flying Blue Angel number two, the right wingman from Canadian, Texas, Lieutenant Commander James Haley. Flying Blue Angel number one, the commanding officer and flight leader of the Blue Angels from Fargo, North Dakota, Commander Brian Kesselring. Ladies and gentlemen, representing your United States Navy and Marine Corps, the Blue Angels 2021. And congratulations to the Blue Angels for their second performance of the season as we see them taxi back thanks to Live Air Show TV and the great angles they're getting. And a nice round of applause from all of you who are here for Lieutenant Julius Bratton, the voice of the Blue Angels. I got very excited. Yay! <laughs> I, got ex I get excited too. I mean, I get to work with these guys, so it's fun. Hey, we're just about to wrap it up. Let me first go up to Dave Keim up on, uh, up on the tower. Dave, your thoughts as we wrap up this this sun and fun for 2021 well i'll tell you rob it's been a great show today it's been a great show all week uh wonderful flying wonderful weather and it looks like the world's coming back to us finally everybody's emerging from their den and, <laughs> and getting back out in the world and i think sun and fun had a great deal to do with that and we need to keep that going i believe and uh, it's a wonderful show it's up to the uh the cause it's for uh it doesn't get any better in the Aerospace uh, Center for Excellence. Indeed. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to next year. I, I, it, I hate to leave. It seems like we just got here, and we've been here over a week. So, <laughs> anyway, it's a great show. Been, have, been having a lot of fun. Won an award. Doesn't get any better than that. So, that's my thoughts. How about you? Well, we're, uh, well, I'm going to run down the line. Thanks, Dave, and I appreciate your being here and all your years of service here. Congratulations on those awards uh, for over 30 years of service. Larry Strain, what you got? Fantastic weekend. Great flying. Record crowds, record admissions, records everything here for Sun and Fun, and that's what it's all about. We're here to provide some emphasis, I hope, on uh, people supporting the Aero Center Space for Excellence. And I just want to say, too, that it has been an extreme honor to be on the stage here with you two professionals. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this team. Thank you, sir. Steph? Boy, I tell you what, um, to, to be surrounded by people I consider a mentor and, and a friend and to, to have this opportunity to share the stage uh, with you has been absolutely fantastic. And as we look on the screen here, um, you know, the images provided by Live Air Show TV to be able to bring you this broadcast to bring people watching from all over the planet a front row seat to what's going on. That's been an absolute joy. I popped over and these guys, these two next to me, also friends that gave me a lot of grief because I actually left the set to go watch up at the narration stand. So I had an opportunity to, to learn firsthand some of the differences in the way the Blue Angels uh, maneuver. So that, you know, the differences between the Super Hornet and how they actually do their demonstration. I found the information fascinating and I hope the team, as the season progresses, it, it has an opportunity to share some of that information with everyone here who is just all of us fans of the Blue Angels. We are indeed. The Super Blues. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get the in so much blues. trouble for yeah. that. Hey, it might stick. You never know. <laughs> and I'll just say thank you to Dave Keim, to you, Larry, to you, Stephanie, to work with you guys. Live Air Show TV, Mark McGinn from Onboard Images, the gang from Air Show One. I thank Sporty's Pilot Shop. I thank Flying Magazine for to be involved in the I Learned About Flying from that I Laughed podcast and also the Hartzell Propeller Company. But to all of you who are watching around the world, and as Stephanie said, we had 82 countries logged in yesterday. I don't know how many today, but you are seeing what is the, the phoenix bird, if you will, coming out of the ashes after what was a tough season for 
all of us in the air show industry last year. We're looking forward to lots more, and Live Air Show TV will be on hand for a number of them throughout this season, and I hope you'll join us for all of those. On behalf of Dave Kime, Larry Strain, Stephanie Strickland, I'm Rob Ryder. So long, everybody. Thank you.